Hello? Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's really nice to see a full room um, of participants here in person. And then uh, also welcome to all of you who are joining the session online. It seems like at least a third of the conference participants are joining uh, virtually. So welcome to everyone. Uh, our session today is Ocean Deoxygenation, Physical, Biogeochemical, and Ecological Research Advances and Future Needs. And I'd also like to introduce my co-chairs, Marilar Gregoire from uh, the University of Liège, Yasir Edebar, who will join us later today from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and then Kirsten Isensi from IOC UNESCO, Oh, and I'm Natalia Gallo from the University of Bergen. Um, so uh, this is our kind of first morning session today. And we start with our invited speaker, who's Maggie Johnson from KAUST in Saudi Arabia. She's an assistant professor there. And her research group is on global change ecology. And her talk today is titled Recognizing Deoxygenation as an Emerging Stressor on Coral Reefs. Uh, and she is currently on field work at a remote field site. It was a recent research opportunity that just came up, so she apologizes for not being able to be here with you in person, um, but she submitted her talk for us to watch. And maybe she's online and available for questions afterwards if the ship internet is holding right now. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's welcome Maggie to the screen. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining me as we kick off this session 11, thinking about the physical, biogeochemical, and ecological research advances and needs for ocean deoxygenation research. A big thank you to the session organizers for the invitation to speak here. I'm very sorry that I'm not able to be there in person. I'll do my best to be online for the question session at the end of the talk. However, you may have to bear with me a little bit because I'll be in a remote field location, potentially with some stuff some spotty internet. I'm going to turn my camera off now for the rest of the recording and we'll turn it on again at the end just so you can see the full slides. So I'm excited to be telling you a little bit about the research my group is working on looking at ocean deoxygenation as an emerging stressor on coral reefs. Now we know that coral reefs are important ecosystems for a variety of reasons. In this photograph here you can see a happy, healthy, thriving coral reef habitat and they provide a variety of ecosystem goods and services. They support more than 25% of marine biodiversity, even though they cover less than 1% of the sea floor. They provide home and habitat to a variety of ecologically and economically important species. And the physical structure of the coral reef, that framework, actually protects shorelines from the damaging activity of waves and storms. And then we have the natural aesthetic beauty and importance of coral reefs but unfortunately, instead of seeing reefs like I've just showed you a picture of, or like the one that you can see here where we have living coral cover, we're seeing reefs shift towards these habitats where we see less living coral cover. And one of the main focuses of my research group is really trying to understand what the drivers of decline are for coral reef community structure and function. And I think about anthropogenic impacts in two different categories. These are the main things that are really contributing to the decline of coral reef habitats across the globe. At the local scale, where you can see the point source of the impact, we have things like sedimentation, nutrient pollution, and overfishing. On the other hand, we also have global impacts. These are stressors that are related to increasing carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere, including ocean warming and ocean acidification. Now you could also put ocean deoxygenation into this category as well, but I like to think about deoxygenation, particularly in coastal habitats, as kind of the perfect storm of local and global stressors. So we have our global stressors like warming and depletion of oxygen in, ocean, in the open ocean and coastal habitats related to these global impacts. But then we also have local stressors like eutrophication, nutrient pollution, that are really exacerbating the formation of deoxygenation and deoxygenated areas in coastal environments. And to go over very quickly, what I'm referring to when I'm referring to these coastal deoxygenation events, they're also sometimes referred to as hypoxia events. So here we're considering a coastal environment where you have relatively low nutrient input, 
and you have mixing of surface ocean with the atmosphere, you may have some algae growing in the surface waters and cell sinking down to the bottom, decomposing and producing just a very little bit of hypoxia along the benthos. But the conditions are relatively well mixed and we don't see formation of hypoxic conditions or really low oxygen conditions forming and impacting the benthic environment. On the other hand, when we have high nutrient inputs into that coastal environment, we can see those nutrients fueling the growth of microalgae in the surface waters, and we can see the formation of algal blooms. Now, when those algae die and sink to the bottom, we have microbial respiration, consumption that are further depleting oxygen concentrations just along the benthos. And then when we combine that with global impacts like warming, we also see increasing stratification of the water column. In the end, we see these low oxygen areas along the benthos growing and becoming more intense, showing up into the coastal environments and having an impact on the shallow marine communities there. So it's a combination of these local impacts, such as eutrophication, increasing algal productivity, pollution, increasing organic inputs, combined with our global impacts, warm water holding less dissolved oxygen, more growth, more stratification, really interacting to create these pockets or coastal environments where we're having intense deoxygenation conditions that result in mass mortalities or can result in mass mortalities in benthic organisms that aren't able to escape from those low oxygen conditions. So I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about specific oxygen concentrations uh, in reference to a deoxygenation event and some experiments I'll tell you about in just a moment. And so to give you a reference for what I'm talking about, when we're thinking of normal oxygen conditions in seawater, I'm referring to normoxia. This is where we have six to eight milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen, and it's where we see normal behavior of our marine organisms. When we start to deplete that oxygen level, we get towards hypoxia. This is where we start to see the behavioral and physiological effects of oxygen depletion, and typically it occurs around two to three milligrams per liter. However, I will add that this can be taxa specific. And it's a really outstanding question about what the levels of hypoxia are for coral reefs. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. So during these hypoxic conditions on a coral reef or in other coastal environments, we can see behavioral impacts when we see this oxygen depletion to around two to three milligrams per liter. You see fish kills, you see changes in vertebrate behavior like that photograph on the bottom where you have brittle stars that have climbed to the top of a coral balmy to try and escape low oxygen conditions. And when we have complete depletion of oxygen from seawater, we get anoxia. This is where you see anaerobic metabolism. And when we have these low oxygen conditions form and organisms are not able to escape from them, that's when we start to see these mass mortality events. Sometimes it's referred to as the dead zone. And this is really well studied, relatively well studied in temperate habitats, um, open ocean perhaps, where we know that some of these deoxygenation or hypoxia events can cause dead zones and mass mortalities and really lead to ecosystem collapse. However, in the tropics, deoxygenation is really only emerging recently as a critical stressor on coral reefs. 2017, a paper came out by Andrew Altieri and colleagues documenting tropical mass mortalities that are implicated with hypoxia. In this map that you can see pictured here, we have documented dead zones in temperate regions indicated by the red dots. In the orange dots, we have hypoxia, where it's been implicated in coral reef specific mortality, but not necessarily um, explicit, explicitly documented. And then in the purple bluish areas where we have our coral reef area. And so what you'll notice is that there are relatively few quantified sites where we have documented deoxygenation or hypoxia events in the tropics. And then the study that came out in 2017, they documented an event um, really well characterized with the oxygen levels on a coral reef in Boca del Toro, Panama, and we'll revisit the site in just a few slides, but seven years later. So the objective of my talk, and what I'm hoping that you'll take away from the talk today is that main, the main objective is to think about deoxygenation and how it may contribute to coral reef degradation. So the first objective is to talk about the effects of an in-situ deoxygenation event 
on a coral reef. And the second one is to tell you a little bit about some of the lab work we've done quantifying the sensitivities of reef building corals to deoxygenation. For this first part, this has been a collaboration between myself and several of my colleagues who are associated with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, particularly the microbial work that I won't tell you about in too much detail was led by my uh, collaborator, Jared Scott. Okay, so if we go back to this map, specifically gonna be talking about hypoxia that occurred at the same site that happened in 2010, but it reoccurred in 2017 in the same general location, but on different coral reefs. So in 2017, I was working out in the field with one of my interns and we were sitting on the boat appreciating how beautiful the conditions were. It was glassy, it was calm, it was warm. And we got in the water to do some benthic surveys and we realized that it looked almost like Armageddon. So in this photograph, what you're looking at is a massive coral, a massive Orbicella coral, and you have brittle stars and sea urchins that have crawled to the surface or piled on top of each other, trying to escape from low oxygen conditions. So they're trying to get to the highest point of that mounding coral. We also saw a formation of these microbial mats, that white kind of filamentous mat that's growing on the, the sponge in this picture. That's diagnostic of hypoxic or even anoxic conditions. We saw bleaching. So in this picture here that I'll circle with my mouse, you can see a bleached coral. And then here we have a massive mounding coral that has been alive for, or was alive for hundreds of years and died during the deoxygenation events. So we saw bleaching and really just mass mortality occurring at a relatively shallow depth. So we're talking about three meters at the shallowest point. And here we've got another image of gastropods and brittle stars just piled of each other. So we mobilized our team to go back out and to measure the dissolved oxygen concentrations across this Bay of Almirante that you can see pictured here. For those of you who are familiar with Bocas del Toro in Panama, the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute is indicated by this white star here. So what we found from going out to survey these sites across a broad spatial gradient is that the inner bay that you can see here had very low uh, near anoxic conditions, I'll say, on the benthos, all the way back in this inner bay. Some of the other sites, however, remained under relatively normoxic conditions. They weren't impacted by this event. And again, I'll point out that the sites that were impacted here in 2017 are different than those that were impacted in 2010. So we went to these, we went to a site that represented the impacted site or the impacted by hypoxia site and one that was not impacted where experienced flushing and normal conditions. And we surveyed the corals in order to try and identify some of the physiological effects of that deoxygenation event. So we collected Agaricea tenifolia, that's the lettuce coral. It's a common coral in the Caribbean. We brought it back into the lab and we measured its photochemical efficiency using a PAM fluorometer. This tells us a little bit about the health of a coral. We looked at the symbiont densities, and the chlorophyll A content. So to tell you about the photochemical efficiency, so in this figure here, we have our maximum quantum yield. On the x-axis, you have your two different treatments, your corals from the normoxic site in blue, from the hypoxic or impacted site in red. And what we found was that there was lower maximum quantum yield for corals that came from the hypoxic site. Now this it was what we expected, considering that the corals looked much more like this, that you can see pictured here, where they were bleached. And so this, uh, these, these numbers here tell us that the bleaching we saw in the field was having a physiological impact. It was also supported by the symbiont densities that you can see pictured here. On the y-axis, we have the symbiont densities or symbiont counts, and then we have our chlorophyll A concentration, which are all kind of the indicators of coral bleaching. Bleached corals are unhappy corals. So this is telling us that the corals are stressed under deoxygenation and also that depleted oxygen conditions could be a factor in driving coral bleaching stress responses that we see in the field. In addition to this, we also took some measurements of the benthic community and of the microbial community. 
On the left side in this graphic, it's representing the hypoxic site during the hypoxic, hypoxic event and then after. So by looking at the microbial community from the water column just above the reef, we found that there was a significant shift in the microbial assemblage during the event, but after the event, that microbial community reverted to what we'll call a normal microbial community. It's the same as what we saw over at our control site. The benthic community, however, although it changed during the hypoxic event, we saw increasing numbers of dead corals, coral bleaching. We saw very little recovery of that reef after the event. And then we went back and surveyed that coral reef a year later, there was still very little coral recovery. So it's telling us that the microbial community was rapidly impacted by the event and it quickly recovered while, as, while the benthic community was impacted by the event and it was very slow to cover. So to give you some more visual evidence of what this looks like on the coral reef, here we have a, a cropper cervicornis colony, the branching staghorn coral. It was live before the event. It was probably one of the last stands of a cropper cervicornis in the bay in Bocas del Toro. During the event, it died. A year later, you can see the skeleton. And then two years later, you can see complete collapse of that colony and of the framework. And what we've noticed from revisiting the site years later is that recovery of that community has been extremely slow. But there are some glimmers of hope because although this is what the deeper reef community looked like, and I'm talking about coral reefs that were at depths of say 10 meters or deeper, maybe a teeny bit shallower, most of those corals died during the event. But shallower than that, the corals that were impacted by the hypoxia event, most of them died, but some of them did survive. And this is what has driven some of our work that's developed since then, is trying to understand what it is about some corals, make them able to tolerate some of these deoxygenated conditions more than others, with the hopes that we can use this information to inform some coral restoration practices, for example. So in that first study that I just told you about, we documented the effects of an in-situ deoxygenation event on a coral reef. And this was really the first time that we were able to collect data on the environmental conditions. So we know the actual levels of oxygen during the event, as well as the benthic community response, the microbial community response, and the response of the corals. Now in the second part, I'm gonna be telling you about the response of reef building corals to deoxygenation, but in the lab. This work was conducted in Fort Pierce, Florida at the Smithsonian Marine Station. And it's the design that it takes um, builds a little bit off of ocean acidification experiments, if you're familiar with those. So here we have our mesocosm tanks, our aquaria. We bubble nitrogen gas into some of those tanks to deplete oxygen concentrations. We bubble air into others as a control. And using this technique, we're able to decrease oxygen concentrations in seawater and maintain them at stable and low values. So for this set of experiments, we have ambient oxygen levels at around six milligrams per liter. And then we decrease it to 4, 2, and 0 0.5 was the lowest we could get, and that's just above anoxia. So we grew corals under these four different treatment levels. We used two species of corals, a cropper cervicornis. Again, this is the staghorn coral, a Caribbean species that's really important for coral restoration efforts. It's also very sensitive to changes in the environment and threatened by environmental change. Then we have Orbicella fabulata. You can see pictured here and these little pucks of this mounting coral. We expose corals to these treatment conditions until half of the corals in the lowest treatment suffered mortality. And the reason for this was that we wanted to have some living coral tissue remaining that we could sample for some of our response variables. We measured photophysiology, similar to the experiment that I told you about just previously. Again, this tells us about the relative or overall health of our coral. We looked at tissue loss and mortality and symbiont densities. And today I'll tell you about these first two, the photophysiology and tissue loss and mortality. To orient to this graph that you see pictured here, we've got maximum quantum yield, the results of our PAM fluorometry on the y-axis. We have time on the x-axis and the top figure is for a crop or silver cornice. Four different deoxygenation treatments. We have ambient 4, 2, and 0.5 milligrams per liter. 
We grow corals under continuous exposure to these conditions. And for the Acropora, we started to see an impact of only the most extreme treatment starting at around three days. So the total duration of the experiment was about five days. We did the same thing for our Orbicella fabulata. And the first thing that you'll notice is that the experiment was much longer. So it ran for about 11 days and we started to see an impact, again, only in the most severe treatment at around eight days of exposure. So the interesting things here are that we see effects of the severe depleted treatment only. After two days in Acropora, minimal to no effects in our Orbicella, there was a little bit of an effect on the maximum quantum yield, but relatively small compared to the response of Acropora. Now, this is partly interesting because if you'll, mention, if you'll remember what I mentioned about the hypoxia levels and thresholds before, two milligrams per liter is typically what's used to describe hypoxia in marine environments. But here we found that these corals were unaffected largely by exposure to two milligrams per liter. So we really only start to see this hypoxic response at around 0.5, which is a pretty severe depletion of oxygen. So to give you an idea of what this looks like for tissue loss and mortality, here we've had a crop or cervicornis. Again, only a significant effect of the most severe treatment. We started to see an effect after about two to three days. And we saw tissue loss in only the Acropora species. We did not see it in Orbicella. So here on the left side of this, we have our initial exposure to uh, the treatment conditions. So that's what they were starting at. And then you can see after four days of exposure, what the corals looked like, or 11 for Orbicella. So what we can see here is after a few days of exposure for our Acropora coral, we started to see that tissue loss, and it's very obvious by this white patch that you can see here. We saw no similar effects with our Orbicella, which is very interesting. So thinking a little bit more about what these results mean. So we found that the hypoxia sensitivity in these coral species is species specific. Acropora cervicornis, the staghorn coral, was the most susceptible, and it responded to the deoxygenation treatments around two days, again, only the severe treatment. Orbicella fabulata was largely tolerant. It lasted for 11 days and could have gone longer. And though I didn't show you the data for this, we did run experiments with Sideroastria radians, which was largely tolerant. So we ran the experiments for just about three weeks, a little bit more, and we found that it was largely unaffected by exposure to even the most severe deoxygenation treatment, which is pretty interesting. So the results that I just told you about were from some work I did with colleagues in Florida that was funded by NOAA's Coastal Hypoxia Research Program with the idea that we can evaluate how these corals are affected by exposure to deoxygenation and use that information to inform how we're doing coral restoration and restoration practices. So to give you a quick summary, in the first part, we talked about the effects of an in situ hypoxia event on a coral reef, the resulting mass mortality, the impacts on the benthic community and the microbial community. We found that the deoxygenation event did lead to coral bleaching, benthic community shifts that have lasted for years. In the second part, we talked about the response of reef building corals in the lab to hypoxia. And we found that species responded differently to deoxygenation. Orbicella fabulata was more resistant. Sideroastria radians was the most resistant, and, or, and Acropora cervicornis was relatively sensitive. Now, again, I'll remind you that they responded to only the most severe treatment. That was 0.5 milligrams per liter. So we really need to think about our hypoxia thresholds and how it can vary depending on the taxa. Generally, corals seem to be relatively tolerant to changes in oxygen concentrations, but some species are more sensitive than others. So what does this mean for coral reefs? Unfortunately, deoxygenation is not a Bocas del Toro problem. It has the potential to impact reefs much more broadly. And from the Altieri study in 2017, they found that more than 10% of reefs globally are at elevated risk of exposure to deoxygenation. This is why we consider deoxygenation as an emerging stressor on coral reefs. It's not something that we've typically thought about in the past. Much of the research on coral reefs and environmental change has focused on warming, on ocean acidification, and now we really need to raise awareness to the fact that deoxygenation, changing oxygen concentrations, can be really important for influencing 
community structure and persistence of coral habitats. The last thing that I will note is that some of my colleagues and I are hosting a research topic in Frontiers in Marine Science, Drivers and Consequences of Ocean Deoxygenation in Tropical Ecosystems. And I encourage you all to submit a manuscript to this or to email me if you have any questions about it. The deadline for manuscript submission has been extended and now it's looking like it will end at, towards the end of June. But if you have any interest in this, please do get in touch with me and we can discuss this a little bit more. Thank you so much for your attention. I will turn my camera back on. Again, my apologies that I'm not able to be there. I will be available online, hopefully to answer some questions. And if you're not able to get me online, you're welcome to send me an email and I'd be happy to answer any questions that way. So thank you very much. All right, um, so this is a great opportunity since it's the first session of the morning to get everybody familiar with the Whova app. Um, so hopefully most of the people in the room have downloaded the Whova app. It's a really excellent resource for uh, getting around the conference and knowing what talks to go to and interacting with all of the different speakers and it allows us to have a more integrative uh, session for those who are joining virtually and in person. So if you go to Maggie's talk, Recognizing Deoxygenation as an Emerging Stressor on Coral Reefs, she is in fact online and responding to questions because I asked her one and she responded. Um, you can then go to the Q&A option and then ask a question. So uh, while you're trying that out uh, on your phone, um, I will read my question and Maggie's answer to it. Um, I said, Maggie, I have a question about your interpretation about the brittle stars and urchins on top of the coral during the deoxygenation event. We see, especially for brittle stars, high aggregations under very low oxygen conditions on continental margins, and generally brittle stars tend to be tolerant to very low oxygen. Could they be migrating to the dying coral as a feeding opportunity as opposed to escaping the low oxygen conditions? And so Maggie responded, it's possible that could drive them to aggregate, but most of these brittle stars were dead within a day or two. If it were only feeding, you might expect them to move on before mortality. Agreed. She says there's some nice work by Noelle Lucy about brittle star tolerance to hypoxia that's come out recently. So it could be that they're uh, much more sensitive to hypoxia in coral reef ecosystems than the deeper brittle stars on continental margins. So if anybody would like to uh, offer a question, that's how you would do it in the Whova app. Um, and Maggie will be able to see your question and she'll either have time to respond to that question during our session or uh, you're welcome to ask the question. And she also said that she would be answering questions throughout the conference period. So you can either ask here or email her directly um, if you look at her contact information on Whova. Um, so those are some different options for reaching out to the speakers who are uh, participating virtually. Also for poster presenters, you can find their posters through Whova and send them messages. Yeah, um, you can also like her talk. So there's a, you can hit the heart and give her a like for her talk. Um, it also looks like there's a chat option. So you can also uh, chat with her. So it looks like we have one person who has chatted with Maggie about her talk. She says, great to hear about the work on coral deoxygenation. I hope you're enjoying KAUST and have a successful fieldwork campaign. So that's from Kalina Grab, and uh, so you can chat directly with the speakers. Um, okay, we've got one more question. So here, uh, but no answer yet. So there is a little bit of a lag on the chats, but this is a question from Stephanie Brossite. She says, to address the effect of hypoxia on the coral reef functions and services, how are you planning to con conduct follow-on research? Many thanks. 
So that might be a longer answer. Uh, so you can always check in and see what Maggie has responded to that question. Uh, but for now, in the interest of time, we're going to move on to our next presentation. Uh, this presentation is by Anne Murray from the University of Bern. Uh, and her presentation is on global impacts of warming and deoxygenation on marine species in the 21st century. So you can also ask her questions through the Whova app afterwards, and we'll try and facilitate as best we can. Thank you. Hello, Moray. And I've worked with Thomas Freulicher and Taylor Clark and William Jerome on this project where we looked at the impacts of ocean warming and deoxygenation on marine species in the 21st century. So when it comes to this warming, about half a degree of warming of sea surface temperatures has already occurred since the 1960s until now. And models project that another up to three and a half degrees of warming on average will occur by the end of the 21st century. So for oxygen, we are really talking about deoxygenation in most of the ocean. Only the stippled areas are robust, but on average, another 13 millimoles per cubic meters is lost by the end of the 21st century, which comes on top of a loss of about 2% since the 1960s until now. So our questions are really, how does this warming and this deoxygenation then impact global habitat viability and what are the drivers of these potential changes? And how are the habitat volumes of different marine species impacted by this warming and deoxygenation and what drives that? So in order to quantify these impacts, we use the aerobic growth index. Very simply put, this is just a ratio between oxygen supply and oxygen demand. And it was very recently developed by Taylor and William. So AGI is a really species specific index. And we use six different CMIP6 models, data, oxygen and temperature to calculate AGI. And we do it for 47 representative species covering the epipelagic, mesopelagic, and demersal zone. And we really try to cover a representative range in species distributions and body size. AGI is calculated as oxygen supply, as I said before, which is an environmental variable, which we take from the model, and oxygen demand, which is species specific. Here given in orange, all the species specific um, components. So species have certain oxygen thresholds. They have a preference of temperature over here. And here we have the influence of temperature from the environment. So that would be the temperature in the model. So why do we choose AGI? It really nicely integrates the effects of temperature and oxygen in a relatively simple single index. And to calculate it, you really only need temperature data, oxygen data, and distribution data for the species, sorry, where its habitat is. And it agrees really well with similar other indices that have been developed in recent years as well. So we can calculate AGI for any species, really, but we need a critical threshold in order to make the step towards impact. And following other stu earlier studies, we used the 10th percentile of all AGI values in species habitat. And we say below this critical threshold, threshold which is the 10th percentile, the habitat is not viable. And above it, we say it's a viable habitat for this species. So let's first have a look at relative changes in AGI, here shown for two degrees of global warming relative to the contemporary or 1995-2014. So relative changes in AGI are entirely species independent. So they can give you just a general uh, feeling of the direction of change in AGI. And you can see here that it's generally color blue. So AGI is decreasing both in the epipelagic, mesopelagic, and demersal realms. And the hatched areas here are where model uncertainty is really high. So habitat viability is decreasing, but what is driving most of this change? And in order to look at this, we split it up into contributions from oxygen, 
first of all, and then temperature. So for oxygen, you can see that it's actually um, contributing to much of the changes in uh, rel relative changes in AGI, particularly at depth. So this, this picture change in AGI due to oxygen is quite similar to this one. So oxygen drives quite an important part of these relative changes in AGI but most of the uncertainty is also coming from oxygen. So you see very many hatched areas because the models disagree, like we saw also on, on the first slide with the CMIP-6 results in the direction of change of oxygen. And then for temperature, which is a more certain change, it's warming and warming is generally reducing AGI, which directly follows from the equation I showed you in the last slide. But you also see warming is really most important at the surface. So the signal is by far the strongest and at deeper depths, oxygen becomes more important. So to go from these results to species specific changes in habitat, we use the critical threshold of AGI as I introduced before. So if we have a look at the species specific impacts, here we show habitat change, so negative habitat change would be habitat loss at two degrees of warming and three degrees of global warming for all these 47 studied species. And you see that for most species, losses are small in the order of a few percent, but for individual species, losses can be quite significant in the order of to 25% habitat loss of the contemporary habitat volume. So we present this here in these relative losses. So relative to the contemporary habitat size, what percentage of that is lost? But if you look at it in absolute terms, this same picture shows up quite different because wide ranging species for wide ranging species, which are generally here in the right in the epipelagic, these very small relative changes can translate in very large volumetric changes here. Uh, millions of cubic kilometers. And note that the volumes are smaller uh, for these deeper depths. So to conclude on, on this slide, loss is generally small, but individual species can experience much larger changes. And when interested in absolute changes, which might be, for example, relevant for fisheries, these re small relative changes can translate in very large absolute losses. So in order to understand the differences between these species, we will have a look at the probability density function of AGI values in a species habitat. Here shown for the Atlantic tuna, which lives over here. So the contemporary PDF of all AGI values for the species here shown in black is really skewed towards the left, which means that if you change AGI by only 0.1 in the mean in the whole habitat, you get this red distribution, which has a relatively large part of the distribution at subcritical values below the critical level of AGI, which is indicated here in this gray vertical bar. So only a small change in AGI in the mean exposes a relatively large part of the habitat to subcritical values, making that part of the habitat not viable to sustain a population of this species. And we can go a step further and thereby quantifying this kind of vulnerability to change in AGI by calculating the CDF. So we just uh, take the cumulative sum of this PDF. And by doing that, we can calculate the slope at the critical value of AGI. And we get a quantitative estimate of vulnerability of this species to change in AGI. And here, for example, that means 9% of volume loss for just this 0.1 change in AGI in the mean. An important thing is that this is really different from species to species. So if we do the same exercise for the big eye tuna, you see that the distribution of AGI values is more skewed towards the right. So it's further away from the critical threshold of AGI, meaning that for the exact same change in mean AGI of 0.1, you expose a much smaller volume of this species habitat to subcritical values here, only about 1%. So actually we find that 80% of the variance in relative habitat loss 
which I showed you in this in these box plots in the previous slide, can be explained by this concept of vulnerability. And more importantly, just absolute changes in temperature, so the amount of warming or the amount of oxygen loss or relative changes in AGI are actually really poor indicators of habitat loss. So you really need to have an understanding of the distribution of AGI values in a specific species habitat to understand how it might respond to warming and deoxygenation. With that, we come to our last slide. Take home messages. I've introduced you to AGI, which simply is oxygen supply over oxygen demand. And it nicely integrates both the effects of temperature and oxygen on marine species and the viability of their habitat. It has a really broad applicability, which is excellent for this study. So I've shown you that AGI is generally decreasing in all realms we have studied, so the epipelagic, mesopelagic, and demersal realms. And this, this is driven by a combination of warming and deoxygenation. But however, for this to be impactful to the species, uh, I've shown you that habitats are generally compressed by less than about 5%, but that for specific species, these changes can be much larger, like up to 25%, depending on the species and on the warming level. And absolute losses are really largest for the most wide ranging species, even though their relative losses can be in the order of just a few percent. So to understand these large differences between species, I've introduced you to this concept of vulnerability, which explains about 85% of the variance in impact and is more important than absolute changes in temperature, oxygen, or relative changes in AGI. These latter three are actually quite poor indicators of habitat loss. So with that, I want to thank you and hope to get some questions. Bye-bye. Thank you, Anne, for her talk. Um, so again, you can ask uh, Anne questions through the Q&A option. Uh, I'm not sure if she's there right now, so I think she would be answering questions afterwards. Um, but also, it's always an option to set up um, you know, a one-on-one -on -one meeting with any of the speakers. So you have the option to chat or contact the speakers if you'd like to know more about their work. Um, so unfortunately, uh, our next speaker, um, we had Lysing Frederick from the Universitat de Concepcion. Uh, unfortunately, she is not at the conference. Um, however, it seems she's doing really interesting work on ocean deoxygenation and the effects of that on planktonic assemblies in productive coastal upwelling zones. So I guess stay tuned for that research in the future. Um, but I'm going to use these next uh, 15 minutes since we don't want to get off schedule. Our next talk will be at noon, but I'll just use it for housekeeping because all of the next talks will be live. Um, and then we'll also use it as an opportunity to talk a little bit about the discussion session that's later today. Um, and then also give you an opportunity to meet each other, stretch your legs. Uh, so just to housekeeping for the rest of the speakers in today's session. Um, if you could just make sure that you go to the back table and get a mic before your talk, that would be great. We have two wireless mics back there. So just make sure you're hooked up before your talk time. And then after your talk, please uh, go to the back and return your mic. Um, we'll be here in the front, and I'll make a five-minute sign. So when you have five minutes until the end of your total time, I'll show that. And then a minute before the end of your time, I or one of the other co-chairs will stand up. Uh, so please make sure you're watching your times. It's, of course, a little bit harder. And you'll present from up there, so you'll be able to see your slides and advance your slides there. Uh, at the end of the day today, we are going to have a 30-minute discussion period, so from 4.30 to 5. 
the goal of this discussion is to really hear your thoughts about how the deoxygenation community can contribute to the global ocean oxygen decade, which is a UN ocean decade program. We want to hear how you'd like to contribute and also how the program can you know, support in a scientific way your own research endeavors. So that'll be the goal of the discussion session. So please do come for that. And then lastly, you know, science is all community-based. We have a lot of excellent scientists in this room. So I'd like you to take the opportunity, since we do have some downtime, to introduce yourself to some people who you don't already know. Uh, and then, of course, say hi to your longtime colleagues as well. We have a lot of early career scientists who are attending this conference. So if you see some new faces, please introduce yourself and hear about what they're working on. And then we will reconvene at uh, noon for the next talk, which will be Amy Wyeth. Uh, if everyone could find their seat. I hope you enjoyed the opportunity to stretch your legs and walk around and maybe meet some new people. Um, we have our next speaker who's here in person, Amy Wyeth from the University of Washington. And her talk today is on in situ and laboratory observations of zooplankton um, and how they show avoidance and changes in swimming speed in response to chemical stress. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, hi, so I'm Amy Wyeth. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Washington in Seattle. And today I'm going to talk to you about some of my dissertation work that broadly looks at the effects of environmental stress on zooplankton behavior. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that this work was conducted on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people, the land which touches the shared water of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. So chemical and physical stressors are increasing in duration, intensity, and extent in coastal waters and estuaries around the world. And two chemical stressors I focus on in my research are hypoxia and acidification. Coastal hypoxia is typically the result of increased nutrient runoff from land, which results in increased production in the surface water. This organic matter eventually sinks to depth where it's bacterially respired in a process that consumes oxygen. Additionally, coastal environments are also experiencing increased acidification, and this uh, excess CO2 can either come from anthropogenic CO2, anthropogenic atmospheric CO2, or also CO2 released during that uh, respiration at the seafloor. Differences in temperature and salinity can result in stratification of the water with limited mixing between surface water and deeper water. And for that reason, in coastal systems, hypoxia and acidification are typically found at depth. Environmental stressors can be lethal to some marine organisms. However, there's a range of tolerances between species. And differential responses affect the relative abundance and spatial overlap between predators and prey. Shown here is just a nice picture of the food web in the Pacific Northwest, and you can see some of the economic important fisheries. Um, my research mainly focused on zooplankton, which is a critical link between phytoplankton and higher marine or higher trophic levels. Uh, specifically, my work focuses on copepods, which are a group of crustace crustaceous zooplankton. Copepods have a range of. Oops. I don't know how to. Hmm. Well, that's sometimes a video, but. Copepods have a range of species-specific swimming behaviors that they use to reposition themselves, feed, find mates, and escape from predators, an example of which is shown here. Um, and understanding how chemical stressors affect copepod swimming behavior is critical because individual behaviors affect vertical population distributions, and population distributions affect uh, higher trophic levels that rely on copepods as a source of food. We conducted a series of laboratory experiments that looked at the effects of bottom water hypoxia and acidification on the swimming behavior of the copepod Calanus pacificus. From preliminary trials, we knew that copepods swam downwards when they were introduced to the top of the tank, which allowed us to place our chemical stressor at the bottom, as it's seen in the field, and record how zooplankton interact with that bottom uh, chemical stressor when they undergo their normal downward swimming behavior. And while I'm going to spend very little time talking about results from this paper today, um, we found that 
Um, hypoxia and acidification had significant effects on vertical distribution, swimming behavior, and mortality in the copepod species. And so shown here, I'm showing you the total swimming speed recorded by bottom cameras, so speed within that chemical stressor for either hypoxic conditions or acidic conditions. And you can see that swimming speeds were significantly slower in both hypoxic and acidic treatments, but that uh, response was larger in hypoxic conditions. And so this led us to wonder whether or not we'd be able to reserve, observe these behavioral responses in situ. Traditional methods for quantifying in situ zooplankton distributions, such as shipboard net toes, are costly, they're incredibly limited in scope, and they require um, investigation by, or analysis by trained investigators. And shown here are just some nice pictures highlighting all the steps that go into processing traditional shipboard net toes. However, a combination of two rapidly developing technologies uh, remotely deployed camera systems and artificial intelligence identification of individual zooplankton have the potential to change the type and amount of data that we have available for quantifying zooplankton in the field. To test this idea, we mounted a high-resolution camera on a mooring in Hood Canal in Puget Sound, Washington. The mooring, the top of which you can see here, um, contains a profiling system and records long-term, real-time oceanographic data throughout the entire water column. So we mounted our camera system onto the mooring and used CTD data from the profilers to intentionally park the camera at different depths when the water column was either hypoxic or normoxic throughout. And we ended up with a data set containing hundreds of in-situ video paired with environmental conditions. So here is just an example of one of the videos that we collected. Again, this was recorded in Hood Canal. You can see some copepods are passively drifting with the background flow, some are actively swimming against it, and some are undergoing those fast jumps, which is a common escape response for many species of copepods. We extracted regions of interest that were within the size bands of normal zo zooplankton and stitched them into swimming trajectories, an example of which is shown here. So each of the green lines represents an individual zooplankton and its swimming track. However, with in situ data, if you want real swimming speeds, you have to remove the background flow. Um, so to do this, we use passive particles in the background of the videos um, to generate a spatially explicit flow field using particle image velocimetry, an example of which is shown here. An additional challenge with in situ data is we need to know the general classification of each copepod swimming track. We know that in different species are affected by hypoxia differently and also just have generally very different swimming behaviors. So it's important to be able to differentiate between a copepod and an amphipod, per se. So to address this challenge, we developed an um, um, algorithm with tech partners that are able to identify zooplankton regions of interest, some examples of which are shown here from our videos, and give them a rough classification. Historically, AI is somewhat limited in its ability to consistently um, identify zooplankton. And so by pairing artificial intelligence with particle tracking technology, we're actually able to significantly improve the output of our AI. Shown here, you can see that this copepod track wasn't correctly identified every single time, but because we tracked the individual through time, we're able to use the most frequent identification, smoothing over errors, and significantly improving the output of the AI. And so at the end of the analysis, each swimming path will have a flow field corrected speed, a classification, and environmental data associated with it. We mainly observed three different copepod behaviors in our videos. So to start, I attempted to classify them by binning copepod speeds into three different behaviors, either drifting, cruising, or jumping. Um, so if the instantaneous speed was less than two millimeters per second, I assumed that it was passively swimming with the background flow or passively drifting with the background flow. If the speed was greater than 100 millimeters per second, I assumed that the copepod was exhibiting an escape response and any speed in between was considered cruise swimming. Here I am plotting the average cruising speed for copepods on the y-axis against copepod size bins on the x-axis in either hypoxic conditions in the darker green or normoxic conditions in the lighter green. And you can see that copepods swim significantly slower 
in hypoxic waters relative to normoxic waters, with no significant effect of size. The plot on the right is again showing you copepod size bins on the x-axis, but now I am plotting the number of jumps per video frames on the y-axis, and you can see that copepods exhibit frequent, less frequent escape responses in hypoxic conditions relative to normoxic. And taken together, we hypothesize that copepods suppress energetically costly behavior, such as maintaining cruising speed or exhibiting escape response in oxygen-limited environments. We also calculated Markov chains to approximate the probability of a copepod transitioning from swimming state I, or its initial swimming state, to swimming state J, which is its final swimming state. And this is just an example of one Markov model output, but you can see that there's a probability associated with the copepod transitioning from each of the three swimming states to either the same state or a different state. And model outputs such as this are an incredibly useful way to compare behavioral changes across different environmental conditions. So in this figure, I'm showing you the Markov transition probability of um, the probability of the copepod transitioning from a cruising state to a jumping state. And ecologically, this is approximating the probability of an escape response. And you can see copepods across different size classes are around two times less likely to exhibit an escape response in hypoxic waters relative to normoxic waters. This is another visualization of output from the Markov model. This time I'm showing you the probability of transitioning from a drifting state to a cruising state. And ecologically, this is approximating the probability of resuming normal swimming behavior after a period of stillness. And you can see that copepods are less likely to resume swimming in hypoxic conditions relative to, norm to normoxic. Additionally, there's an interesting size effect here with copepods becoming even less likely to resume normal swimming as they get larger. And this could be because smaller copepods have a larger surface area to volume ratio and are hypothesized to fare better in low oxygen conditions. I want to conclude this presentation by talking about some of the larger implications of these results in the context of changing ocean conditions. How might changes in swimming speed affect population, community, and ecosystem level processes? We could expect a change in swimming speed at the individual level to have energetic implications. However, swimming speed also determines encounter rates with other organisms, with encounter rates um, decreasing with decreasing speeds. So on a population level, decreases in swimming speed will affect an individual's ability to find mates. And on the community level, decreases in swimming speed will affect predator-prey interactions. And these, behavior, these behavioral changes could be a sublethal stress response to changes in environmental conditions. And our work demonstrates that with advances in ocean technology, this response is, is observable in the field and could provide a useful tool in monitoring ecosystem change moving forward. So with that, I want to say thank you to our funders and everyone involved in this work, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have throughout the week. have three minutes for questions, uh, so if anyone has any questions, please come up here to ask them so that everyone can hear and see. So we've got one here, and then Andreas will be next. Hi, thanks Hi. a lot for this very interesting talk. I wanted to uh, better understand, when you were saying that in uh, hypoxic conditions, um, the zooplankton jumps less, is it because of a change in their um, metabolism, or is it because the environment changes and then maybe they have less predators around, for example? So I guess you can see it from the images as well. Yeah, yeah, that's something we've thought about a lot and how to sort of take into account changes in predator distributions um, from our limited camera view. We can't necessarily quantify number of predators present or absent, but that's absolutely something that is probably happening in changes in hypoxic conditions as well. But from just the videos that we're using, um, are, we are sort of leading with the understanding that they're experiencing significantly uh, suppressed me metabolic rates, and that's probably hindering their ability to undergo those energetically costly escape responses. But yeah, thinking about ways to sort of also combine our data set with higher level predator-prey interactions as well as something we're thinking about. <laughs> So 
Sorry, I might have missed this, but um, what oxygen concentration did you select to represent hypoxia? Two milligrams per liter. Okay. So I was just inspired by the predator question because we have done something similar with krill mm -hmm. and looked how they increased the swimming speed while we got oxygenated waters into a fjord. But the increased swimming speed mainly occurred at night and it wasn't related to, to, to diet water migration. So maybe if you study day-night uh, differences, uh, you may get an additional uh, signal. Yeah, yeah, that is, this is still a work in progress, the in situ videos, but something I plan to do moving forward is not just bin by oxygen concentration, but also depth where the individual was recorded in time of day. So I'll have sort of six different groups eventually. <laughs> Um, our next speaker is going to be Ryan Woodland uh, from the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. Uh, and his talk today is hypoxia-induced trophic decoupling across multiple habitats and consumers within a large coastal ecosystem. Thank you, Ryan. All right. Thanks, Natalia. Um, all righty. So just jumping right in. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of a different talk. It's sort of a combination of a couple of different research projects that we've recently completed in my lab. So um, it'll be a little bit more of a higher summary than some of the, um, the previous talks. So I'm going to start out just by uh, reiterating the fact that coastal systems are often very prone to degradation. Maggie did a good job earlier describing why that is. Um, but it's due to a combination of you know, lots of inputs from uh, human activities, including nutrient loading, um, heavy metals, contaminants, sediment sedimentation, but also modification of the basin of the estuary due to dredging, shoreline development, uh, and these lead to changes in circulation, often in stratification, that can, that can have issues for um, water quality and lead to hypoxia. Um, great. All right. So, um, and we have decades now of some excellent research really showing us that um, hypoxia can have major effects on the composition or the structure of these biotic communities and these systems. But we have less information about when and how these structural changes in the communities affects the underlying architecture and sort of energy flow pathways of the food webs. And so most coastal food webs are supported by a range of basal uh, sources of energy or, or producers. Um, and, you know, these in coastal systems, these all often include pelagic and benthic sources, as well as um, terrestrial or, or littoral sources. And these different basal energy sources support a range of diverse sort of um, primary consumers and secondary consumers. And, right, so ultimately those, um, those communities at the base of the food web will support larger, more mobile consumers. Um, and those predators form a really important ecological role in coupling these different energy channels. In the face of hypoxia or other degradation, we can see changes in the fundamental structure of food webs. And so we see often changes in the productivity of these different basal resources, as well as then changes in the abundance or diversity of those uh, lower trophic levels. And then finally, this can alter the, um, the, the strength of different pathways that are available to the predators to support their productivity. And so the research I'll be discussing today is work that's been going on in my lab to look at whether or not we can see evidence that hypoxia alters, um, when and how hypoxia alters the underlying food web structure in a shallow coastal ecosystem. And the reason we, um, I'm focusing on this idea of shallow coastal systems is because we might think a priori these systems are more resistant to the effects of hypoxia um, because they might be better mixed. They might have seasonally ephemeral hypoxia versus the deep systems that might be more consistently hypoxic. So I don't know if this is my slides or what's going on, but um, the two case studies I'll be presenting today focus on one, a fin fish called the white perch, uh, and the second case study is, um, focuses on a crustacean, uh, the mycid, Neomyces americana. Um, we specifically chose these two species because they're both mid-level consumers, they, um, under oxic conditions, they'll integrate both benthic and pelagic food sources. So they're really nice sort of mid-level trophic consumers that might be a good case study. 
And in both of these studies, we use stable isotopes, uh, natural abundance carbon and nitrogen stable isotopes of the, each consumer, as well as some representative end members in the food web to model the contribution of benthic and pelagic trophic pathways to each of these consumers. We also used a couple other methods um, based on stable isotope composition to look at things like trophic position and um, isotopic niche size as a proxy for um, trophic niche width. And so the first case study, um, well, I should start out by saying both of these case studies come from the Chesapeake Bay. Chesapeake Bay is the largest estuary in the United States. It's located on the east coast about uh, midway down uh, the coastline. And so this first case study comes from the Patapsco River Estuary. It's located in the northern part of the bay, and it's the city around which, I'm sorry, it's the estuary around which the city of Baltimore uh, is built. Now, for this particular case study, we selected six different sub-estuaries within the Patapsco River Estuary. You can see them identified here, and you might notice that they sort of fall on, along a gradient of um, highly urbanized, you can see with the red in the uh, watershed, to more suburban um, uh, watersheds. And so we did that specifically look at the effect of changes in uh, land use on uh, conditions within each sub-estuary. But each of these sub-estuaries also experiences different oxygen conditions. Uh, and you can see here uh, some vertical profiles. And you can see all of the systems decline in oxygen with depth. But due to modification of the basins, only some of these estuaries actually reach what we might consider hypoxic conditions. And so after doing some uh, modeling with our stable isotope values using mix mixing models, what we found for the white perch, our fin fish target species um, sampled across those different habitats, was a decline of almost 55% in the contribution of benthic trophic pathways to this consumer um, along this shallow water habitat gradient. And I'm using shallow water habitat gradient instead of hypoxia. Um, because we didn't have as good sort of the, the seasonally resolved hypoxia that we have during the study. But we, um, we did find that strong relationship between the availability of shallow water and um, sort of exposure to hypoxia. So we see a very strong decoupling response of those perch from those benthic food webs when there's not a lot of shallow water habitat. We also see an effect of sort of like land connectivity in terms of a reduced niche dimensions of the white perch uh, under more urbanized conditions in the local watershed. And looking a bit further, what we found was that both of these trophic indis indices, benthic pathway contribution, as well as niche dimensions, were tightly linked to the functional diversity of benthic, benthos, which in these systems. So we're seeing um, hypoxia, most likely, uh, but also some element of the adjacent watershed influencing benthic diversity, and this then leading to um, some pretty significant changes in the ecology of this, um, this mid-level predator. So these are highly impacted urban systems. What about when we look at maybe less developed estuaries? Do we still see a strong sort of effect of, um, sort of hypoxia-induced changes in the food web uh, in these less developed systems? Well, that brings me to the second case study. So we're moving down the Chesapeake Bay now to two estuaries, the Patuxent River and the Choptank River, um, these estuaries are very similar in terms of their size, in terms of their watershed size, but they do differ in some fundamental ways. So, you know, land use within these two basins is quite different. The Patuxent River uh, has a little bit of agricultural land cover, maybe uh, close to 10%, um, but has quite a bit of suburban land development. The Choptank River, on the other hand, shows almost the opposite pattern, uh, being dominated in terms of uh, total land cover by agriculture, and then having a much smaller development um, watershed area. They also differ, differ in terms of their basin morphology. The Patuxent River, especially in the lower basin, is a bit deeper. Um, they also have different circulations. And the net result of these differences is that the Patuxent River is prone to seasonal hypoxia. Uh, especially in the lower basin of the Patuxent, we see the formation of a hypoxia in the deeper waters, whereas in the Choptank River, um, whether we're looking in the sort of the up near the ETM or further down towards the, uh, the mouth of the river, we tend to see normoxic conditions even in the bottom waters. So we're seeing two, two different systems, uh, quite similar in many ways, but one is experiencing seasonal hypoxia and the other does not. 
And so, again, using stable isotope mixing models, um, looking at our target consumer, in this case, the vertical migrating mycid, Neomyces americana, what we find is that the contribution of benthic trophic pathways, uh, here this left plot, is about 60% higher than the contribution of those benthic pathways in the patuxent or the hypoxic system. So we're seeing a strong effect of um, oxic conditions in terms of whether or not these animals are able to access or utilize those benthic trophic pathways. We also see a change in trophic position associate, that's correlated with these changes, changes in uh, sort of basin oxygenation. And so the chop tank river mycids, again, the more uh, oxygenated normoxic system, these animals are experiencing or uh, realizing about a trophic level higher in their trophic position than the uh, mycids from the uh, lax oxygenated hypoxic Patuxent River. And so what I hope I've shown you is a few good examples of how hypoxia has, um, that hypoxia can indeed have pretty pervasive food web effects, even in shallow coastal systems. And, you know, from this studies, we documented a shift in benthic pelagic coupling by the, the white perch, um, most likely through the availability of benthic resources. And we have less information on the benthic conditions in the Patuxent River during the mycid study, um, but I suspect that that's the same, um, same mechanism that's occurring there. We uh, documented decoupling of those benthic and pelagic trophic pathways uh, by each of our major consumers. And we also documented a change in trophic position, most likely due to changes in the availability of different prey sources. And so what are the p potential consequences of this research? Well, first of all, um, I didn't show it, but we do document a change in the condition of the mycids um, in our study. We found that those animals captured in the hypoxic estuary had lower lipid content than those in the normoxic estuary. So this could have consequences for the mycids themselves. Less lipid content could suggest less energy reserves uh, to put into reproduction. Um, and certainly we do observe differences in the abundance of mycids in these two systems. Could also have implications for the higher order predators that rely on mycids as prey. So these animals from the more hypoxic systems might be uh, re have reduced value uh, in the food web for predators. Um, other studies have documented declines in productivity uh, associated with um, shallow water uh, hypoxia. And again, I don't present it here, but we did see declines in fish community biodiversity in the more hypoxic systems in uh, the Patapsco River, as well as uh, reduced mycid abundance in the more hypoxic system. And then finally, uh, there's been some really nice modeling work in other studies that have shown that those food webs that are driven or rely more on pelagic primary production tend to be more variable through time. And so, you know, these systems that might be pushed towards a more of a pelagic food web might also be less stable over the long term uh, and be more um, uh, sort of more prone to sort of these, um, these violent fluctuations in response to disturbance. And so with that, I'd like to take a moment to thank um, some of my co-authors and co-PIs on these uh, projects and papers, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I was wondering about size of the organisms, the study organisms, if that had um, a, a big effect or not. I mean, I could sort of argue my, to myself either way with like white perch mm -hmm. in terms of sensitivity or change. Yeah, that's a good, it's a good question. So we, um, in the mixing model, the, uh, the algorithm we used accounted for body size as a covariate in the model. So um, what I showed you here were the, uh, the results after factoring out body size, but I can tell you that um, the effect of body size was that the smaller animals had a more of a pelagic signal and it tended to shift to more of a benthic signal um, for the older fish. And this sort of follows what we know about the ontogeny and the sort of the, those ontogenic shifts in diet of this, these animals. Okay, and so in hypoxic water, did one 
Did that shift change at all? Or? So there, we did not include an um, interaction term in that model. So I'm not, I can't tell you for certain if that relationship changes based on um, hypoxia, but I can say that that was the general ontogenetic shift that was present, and then after accounting for that, these are the patterns that we saw. Oh, okay, thanks. Sure. Yeah. Uh, during the non-hypoxic period, uh, why are the white perch not feeding on pelagic resources? So they, in the non-hypoxic areas or period, why are they not feeding on benthic? So they are, oh, on pelagic. So uh, they are under the, um, the and may, I don't think I, I breeze through a lot of this, but um, in the, under oxic conditions, the white perch integrate about 20, I'd say 20 to 25 percent of the diet from pelagic um, food webs. And a lot of that is because these white perch are demersal animals. So they're sort of associated with the bottom. They're very structure oriented. And so, you know, a lot of their diet consists of small um, bottom fishes as well as invertebrates, amphipods, isopods, um, polychaetes. These animals that tend to be more uh, benthic associated anyway. So uh, lunch is from 12.30 until 1.30. Uh, please be back here promptly for uh, our next talk by Mayor Pozo Buil at uh, 1.30. Thank you very much for your participation this morning and for bearing with the technological issues. Okay. Hello? Ah, yes. Perfect. So, welcome to the continuation of uh, session 11, focusing on deoxygenation in the ocean. I'm very happy to still have so many people in the room, and hopefully now also a few online, and that the streaming is fixed. Um, I'm Kirsten Inde from the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. Uh, we move to our next speaker. With, no, he has a microphone. Um, and the next speaker is the Christian Punch. I'm just opening it from the uh, <coughs> Environment and Marine Biology, Abu Akadem University in Toko, Finland, and he will present uh, coastal hypoxic upwelling partly mitigates summer heat stress in the temperate benthic community. And fingers crossed that the slides will show. Right? Yes. Thanks. I hope so as well. Yeah. Thanks for for being here, and and uh, really nice to be here. So I will. Uh, I didn't do anything. So I will try to talk uh, about um, a coastal system and how marine heat waves and hypoxic upwelling interact uh, on, on benthic communities. So we all know this, and, uh, but obviously there's more within those, um, within those temperature variabilities, and you can see that this uh, interannual variability can, can also be downscaled to diurnal variability, and there's anything that you can find in between, which I just called stochastic patterns here. And there's something called marine heat waves that people have probably heard about. And, and people have seen those, those slides of, of strong marine heat waves here in, in the Met Sea, uh, um, in, in Tasmania. Uh, I see it on my slide here. And the Baltic Sea um, is one of, of the seas warming uh, very fast. And... Um, and the study we conducted was done in the, in the western, western Baltic Sea, Kiel Fjord area. Well, we do see those marine heat waves. We try to model those uh, using Hopte et al. Um, um, common procedures nowadays uh, to characterize marine heat waves. And you can just see some examples here of different years. And every year, in a way, looks different. Uh, here we, we find some spring heat waves and some strong summer heat waves. And this is something that, that you should bear in mind that is an important aspect. So, this slide here just shows marine or like mean annual temperature uh, over the years, 1997 to 2018, and the marine heat waves um, that occurred in duration and, and intensity. What is important here, uh, more obviously, that, that they obviously occur with, with warmer years. You find more marine heat waves and longer 
stronger marine heat waves, but what is also important that you find them throughout the year. So those events may occur um, throughout the year. And what is important then to consider that marine heat waves are not the only thing that, that happens, and this is why I'm in this session here, is that you can also find hypoxic upwelling that often um, interrupts those marine heat waves. So there is some interplay of, of those two, two drivers for marine ecosystems. And just to illustrate that this is not a, a rare phenomenon, this is something that happens uh, frequently. It's not always as dramatic and as in, in this upwelling that we recorded in 2017, when temperatures obviously dropped to those, this upwelling, uh, salinity increased in the area, but then the oxygen went down to really almost zero in the fjord for, for a couple of days, almost a week, and that uh, co-occurred with, with an increase uh, in CO2 and a drop in, in pH, and that has had strong impacts on the local communities, fish communities in particular, but also crustaceans that try to, to grab for, for oxygen. So this is in contrast to those uh, large uh, sort of hypoxic zones in the Baltic Sea, those coastal hypoxic areas uh, are increasing, and this is something that I would want to, to illustrate now. We've done some monitoring in this fjord area. We can see the, the depths from 0 to, to 14 meters, and you can see that in, in late summer, early autumn, you see this hypoxic hypoxia coming up, and then you see this orange bar here in October, and this is mostly wind-driven upwelling that pushes those water bodies up to uh, shallow communities. Sorry. And, and you can see similar patterns in salinity, temperature, and pH is not as evident, but, but you've seen that in that previous example. We tried to, to illustrate this a bit better, that, that throughout the year, uh, the water masses, this is the comparison of the surface water to the, to the deep water in this area. And you can see that, that this hypoxia in the bottom water develops throughout the year, uh, mostly um, lowest oxygen in, in June, July, and then in, in lowest pH values in, in August, September. And then you have those upwelling events. And depending on when you find those upwelling events, you may have for a shallow water community, may have fertilization, you may have cooling of heat waves that I just mentioned, salination or deoxygenation, or but also strong deoxygenation and acidification. And in contrast to, to those uh, areas in the, in the fjord areas, but also in the Baltic Sea, which are often hypoxic or anoxic, we work with shallow water communities that are not as used to those hypoxic conditions and will frequently experience those today and in the future. And just to set this into an ecological concept is that uh, we have different drivers that, that often are tested in, in synchrony, but this is not what happens here and this is not what happens in many situations. But you may have a, a stressor that, that happens much earlier than another stressor. They may overlap, but they may not. And, and they may act um, in antagonistic, additive or synergistic ways on species or communities. So we used an outdoor mesocosm system at, at Geoma in Kiel, Germany, um, to, to implement different treatments. We manipulated temperature in an offset to, to natural variability, and we had a flow through, and in this flow through, we just switched from the surface water to the deep water, as I've just presented. Those bodies are different, um, and, and we could simulate those upwelling events. And we used a, a common uh, benthic community that we find uh, in that area using um, um, macrophytes, marine macrophytes, and invertebrate, associated invertebrate species. Just a few illustrations to, to show, and this is the, the treatments that we, that we find. You can see the without upwelling treatment, the with upwelling treatment. You can see that during the upwelling, we really lower temperature in those in those tank systems, we increased salinities. This is not as dramatic because there was a natural upwelling. So if you work with those natural or close to natural manipulation studies, it is difficult to control everything. But I will have another example where we controlled more uh, later on. And we did uh, reduce um, uh, pH as well as oxygen to very critical or critical levels. So we really simulated those events in, in those natural systems. Then we wanted to know whether heat waves and upwelling interactively affect those bantic communities and whether upwelling may even provide some refuge from, from those marine heat waves. Um, here you can see some first findings, and uh, for some reason the error bars aren't shown here. This is a generalized additive models, and there should be a shaded area around those, so you just have to trust me that those are 
not fake lines here, but you see the, the, the real uh, measurements as well. And, and on different macrophytes, we find sort of no or small interactive effects of the subwelling and ocean warming that we applied. Um, but we find also in other macrophytes, we find a strong negative uh, and dominant effect of upwelling. So, so warming wasn't as important anymore when upwelling was, was there, but, but really had strong ne negative impacts. And that was also the case for recruitment of, of young uh, um, uh, macrophytes, in this case, Fucus vesiculosus recruits. If we look into the, the same picture, the arrow bars are missing here, the arrow shaded areas, confidence intervals, but you, you have to trust me. Um, the, the number of recruits was strongly impacted by temperature and even stronger um, if, if we had the upwelling occurring. So there was some interaction of upwelling and ocean warming. And we did also find some mitigation or some uh, better growth rates in in mutilus uh, that, that were exposed to frequent hypoxic upwelling compared to warming scenario. But we could also find the resistant of, of species, and this is um, seen if you would see the, the error bars overlapping here entirely. So, so we see different responses of different uh, components in the community to those repeated events. And this was just one part of the entire data set that is currently being analyzed. So there will be more, more of this uh, coming in the, in the near future. And we're trying to, to we, we have heard some, some food web uh, presentation today. We're trying to, to, to analyze those entire communities now using food web uh, frameworks. And, and that is something that will come in the near future, combining some ecophysiology, mesoclosm manipulative studies, and, and food web modeling. And now we'll just come shortly to, to a second example we used an indoor system, so we had much more control of the, of the treatments that we applied. So this is the Kiel indoor bentocosm system, where we could then test the feeding, feeding activity of this Asterias rubens, a really dominant uh, predator in this area, on Mutulus, a, a really dominant prey. So there's a strong interaction of those two. And what we did is we applied... Um, different heat wave scenarios. So this is a common heat wave that we modeled that we find in that area. We try to extrapolate that heat wave in duration and amplitude. And in addition, we, we applied an upwelling event, as is shown before, that we found in that area uh, to simulate sort of a an, an natural scenario that we find throughout the year. Those sea stars were fed every third day, and we could retrieve feeding rates and activity of those starfish and, and growth, et cetera. So we wanted to test whether heat waves of greater severity have stronger impacts and whether upwelling of hypoxic water increases the impact of, of the heat wave. And what we first found is that a heat wave that is slightly increased in amplitude did kill all those sea stars, so they were really dramatically impacted by, by this. So you can see this, so no feeding anymore. They were dying at, at temperatures at 26 degrees, which is one, just one degree above the, the temperatures that we can find today. And we could find that individuals that were impacted temporarily by, by the other events. So you could see when the heat wave occurred, they were reduced in feeding, and then they recovered afterwards. And we could see that hypoxia had a strong effect, but there was strong recovery afterwards. So they were just starting to feed again. But then obviously, in, in some that ended or, or led to a reduced growth in the ones that were exposed to an extended heat wave. So they just fed fed less during the entire period and, and therefore did grow, grow less in total. But then what was really interesting is that, that those uh, starfish that, we, yeah, that we've uh, exposed to a benign and, uh, an extended heat wave before, uh, to, to an extended heat wave before, they were, sorry, they were coping much better with the hypoxic upwelling event than those that were, were not exposed to marine heat waves. So we call them naive uh, asteria. So there seems to be some coupling, even, those, even though those events were really separated in, in time, so they didn't occur at the same time, but they had something like a stress memory that's something uh, discussed in ecology uh, that, that, that prepared them better for that second event. So in, in that case, there, there may be some interaction of those two, two drivers. So to conclude, these studies highlight the complexity of coastal environments. So there's not just one driver changing, and, 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 and an upwelling event is, is sort of a multiple stressor event that, that imposes a lot of changes for an ecosystem. We call them pulse pressure regime, um, and, and that's something that those biota must cope with. 
And therefore, not only warming hypoxia or hypoxia alone, but, but rather the entire ar area of, of environmental drivers, in particular their, their interplay in, in time, but also space, may determine the, the community that we find in, in our coastal, coastal oceans. And just to, to um, highlight that we're trying to, to build some, some mesocosm system up at the moment in, in northern Finland, so trying to, uh, to build up on a network where we can use natural salinity and temperature gradients uh, that we can then apply in, in sort of comparable experiments throughout the, the Baltic Sea and beyond, so we can repeat those studies uh, depending on, on the ecosystem and, and research question of interest. And with that, I would like to take any questions. Thank you. We have uh, three minutes for questions, and I'm sure there are quite a few. No? Yes, Nina. I guess uh, I'm wondering about the importance of the recovery time. Like, obviously, the more recovery you give them in between the stressors, the more unstressed they are, or maybe not, because now they got adopted. This but is important. What yes. is your feeling between different functional groups? How, how, what is the minimum recovery time, for example, or the importance of the duration of it? Can you, do you have I think this ideas? is super difficult to answer for. You've seen that every or, or many of those organism groups respond totally different to those, mm -hmm. to those drivers, so the recovery time will certainly depend on the, on the metabolism of the organism. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, quite often you, you, you would say if you're a, like a short-lived organism, you would experience one of those events as, as something that is changing steadily. But if you're a long-lived organism, you would experience this as a small pulse, right, one, once in a year. So it, it, it totally depends on the organism and the, the longevity of, of an organism, mm -hmm. I think. But do you think it's also linked to the like, metabolic state? Or it is, I think, okay. and also linked to the food availability. If you have enough food available, you may compensate for for some lack in feeding much easier than if you want. Okay. So there's some linkages also in the food webs that yes. we see. Okay. Maybe to incorporate that more in the experimental design True, as well. Yes. Okay. Are there more questions? <coughs> That may, uh, I actually have one. Okay, the slides are gone. But um, you also show different parameters, like affecting, like some with, with growth, or and some with. So, is there one specific parameter you would say is most impacted, uh, or that depends very much on the trait on the on the. Type I mean, of in, in this case, the data aren't like finally analyzed mm -hmm. for for that experiment, and and I've just shown a few that, that, um, that we had already analyzed. And, and obviously, there's, it depends on, on the organism. For, yeah. for, for a sea star, it is important to have prey available. So the, the recruitment of muscles is an important, an important factor, um, as, as well as the growth of muscles, because it provides food. And, and mm. that is a dominant system in, in the Western Baltic Sea, at least. Um, but obviously, mortality is, is a strong effect, and there will be in, in those areas, I think there will be many selection events. Just this fish example I showed, I mean, this just yeah. eradicated much of the fish in the, in the Kiel Fjord. But, and, and there will be some selection towards um, like um, tolerance, and this is something that, that we are at the moment involved in, and also with Kiel, where we try to select communities for resistance in a way. Yeah, important to adapt to yes, what we don't is. want to adapt to. Yes, thank you very much. Before we break for coffee, and this is uh, Francisco, and I'm sorry for not pronouncing the name correctly, Saita La Macchia, uh, Life in this 50 changing world, growth and life history of the glacial Latin fish and Müller's parasite in West Norwegian fjords here from the University of Bergen. Yeah, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. My name is Francesco, and need to figure out how this works. Okay. And I'm a PhD student here in Bergen in the Hypomphere Fish Project led by, by Professor Salvanius, who's sitting there. And today I want to tell you a bit about this little fish species here, Bentosema glaciale, and particularly about its growth in a hypoxic fjord here, not too far from here. Just a quick background. The species is mostly found between 4 and 16 degrees uh, of average temperature, and uh, in the fjords, 
it spawns between uh, early spring, uh, between spring and early summer. And with the spawning season normally coincides with the highest abundance of zooplankton in the region, which is again in spring and, and early summer. Something that is interesting about these fjords is that the normal temperature patterns are not the ones that we might expect. In fact, at more than 100 meters depth, we see kind of a reverse pattern where the highest temperature is recorded during the winter months and the lowest temperature is recorded during the, the summer months. Uh, this is kind of reflected also in the way that the species grows. The ones of you that work with otoliths might know that they show this kind of seasonal pattern with yelling or translucent rings formed during the times of slow growth and opaque rings formed during the season of fast growth. And I will use hyalin and translucent are synonyms here, so just to not get confused. And what we see from fish from the Bentosema in the fjords is that, again, we see the season of slow growth in the otoliths between March and July, and the season of fast growth during, during winter. And so if we think of following a little fish from the moment that it's born all the way until it's some years of age, we will find the otolith core here, which looks just like a little white stone, and it has basically no zonations. And this is the part that's formed during the larval stage and then uh, is the very beginning of the life of the fish. But if we look at the fish just um, uh, a bit after that, then we will see again the otolith core and then this translucent area here, which is due to the fact that when the fish goes through the metamorphosis, it moves into a different depth and it changes diet, and then it goes through a period of stress where the growth is reduced. And then again, we see this translucent ring here. And then we can just go on with the different seasons. So you see again fast growth and slow growth here, and then it goes on and on, basically all the way until the fish uh, is some years of age. This is an age for fish, but they grow all the way up to six or seven years old, not much longer than that. In this fish, this other is here, we're from Masfjorden, which is the hypoxic fjord. But in Fensfjorden, which is a neighboring fjord, we see uh, basically very similar zonation patterns with the only difference that I notice is that there seems to be a kind of shift in the seasonality patterns in the way that when I catch a fish in October, I normally see wider translucent edges in Fensfjorden than is in Masfjorden. And also, I often see weaker seasonality patterns in Fensfjorden than in Masfjorden, but Fensfjorden has a very deep seal compared to Masfjorden. Masfjorden is 70 meters, Fensfjorden is... Uh, some hundred meters, I don't remember exactly, so the, it's much more connected with the, with the other sea. And sometimes we also see some otoliths that look like this. It's from the same species, but this is bathyrite deformation. I only show it there because I think it's very beautiful, but uh, unfortunately for aging purposes or shape analysis or I think human microchemistry, it's kind of uh, useless. But why do we care about this? Well, this species is very important because it's basically one of the main links of, for the carbon transport between the surface and the bottom layers of the water column. In fact, they undergo extensive vertical migration every day. And also, it's, the biomass is very large, and it's, this species has been indicated as a potential food resource for the future. So we really want to know what will happen to the species in the face of climate change. So... Yeah, well, about climate change, because I haven't talked about hypoxia much until now, but that's what I'm focusing on since I'm in hypon fjord fish. Um, my samples come from Mass Fjorden, which is a fjord not too far away from here, as I said. And you can see here, this is some of the years that we, for which we have samples. And in 2016, it turned hypoxic, and it was hypoxic basically uh, until the end of 2020. And then there was an oxygenation event in 2021. And my work is basically uh, at the moment related to, find, to using the uh, increments as a proxy for growth and trying to understand, since I can age these increments, I know in what year each, uh, each ring was deposited, then I can try and relate it with environmental variables for that year. And this is possible uh, to use these increments as a proxy for growth because you can see that there is kind of a very clean linear relationship between the size of the other and the growth of the fish. So I had samples from 2007 and then from 2017 to 2022, and this allowed me to analyze uh, 13 cohorts, so from 2002 to 2005, and then from 2012 to 2020. Most Fjordan is this fjord here, and Fens Fjordan, the one with the deeper seal, is, you can see it here. This is how my data looked like. I have the increment width here, and I can relate it with the age of the fish. And 
I only use data from age two onwards for some reason related to the convergence of the models. But basically, you can see that this is age zero, so basically the, the growth during the uh, first year of the fish. And then the larger growth is in the first year of age. Then they reach sexual maturity, at least most of them. And most of them are mature by the second year of age. So you can see this decline of growth with age, which is also consistent with what we know in general about fish growth. Um, I had a problem here when selecting the environmental variables that I wanted to relate with the odorate growth because these fishes, as I say, they move a lot up and down in the water column. And so it was, I had to decide what kind of environmental information I wanted to include. We had CDD cast uh, for each troll that we had, but it wasn't so obvious to decide what environmental variables to use. I decided to use uh, two environmental variables. So the salinity, temperature, and oxygen at 300 meters of the average depth where we can find the fish. We know that they basically spend most of the time between 100 meters and all the way almost to the bottom. And also I use the environmental variables at 400 meters because even though this is a bit deeper than the average distribution of the species, uh, it could capture better the fjord environmental status in the way that if you look at the CDD cast, you can see that the epoxic signal particularly is better captured. Uh, at depths that are greater than 300 meters. I use linear mixed effect models because they allow me to account for multiple uh, observations since I basically measure multiple times from the same model. It. And also it can handle missing measurements and nested data in a way that it's much easier to, to understand. So this is uh, the structure of my data. I, my response variable was the increment width and then I had several intrinsic, intrinsic extrinsic predictors. And the intrinsic one was basically everything that was, was strictly related to the fish, such as age, sex, and digit captors. And then my environmental variables were temperature, oxygen, and salinity. Uh, I first tried to find the best random effect structure for the models uh, by using restricted maximum likelihood for comparing them. And the um, random effects that helped better in explaining the data were obviously the individual fish and uh, cohort and year plus an uh, individual uh, age slope. And then I, I use this uh, best random structure to find the best intrinsic structure, and then I added the environmental variables. So we can just see this is how the models look like, just very quickly. The best random st uh, structure again included an average uh, and uh, a random slope for age, and then uh, an average intercept, an intercept for uh, the individual fish, and then also an intercept for year and cohort. The, the intrinsic variables that were significant were basically just age with an interaction with sex, and then I also fitted with an interaction between age and temperature, age and oxygen, and age and salinity. The interaction between age and temperature was significant, oxygen was significant, but not in inter interaction with age, and salinity was just not significant completely. And again, I did this for the environmental variables at both 300 and 400 meters. And just very quickly, the results. So very predictably, we found that age was the most influential variable in, uh, in affecting fish growth. And we had this allometric effect of, uh, of age on the fish. So we can see that there is a consistent decline of, uh, of growth with age, as expected. And something that was also interesting is that there was a, a significant ear effect and cohort effect. And the ear effect is normally due to the effect on the environment of the fish, while the cohort effect is normally related to density-dependent variables and also on some specific conditions that the fish might have experienced during their early life stages. Something that was completely unexpected for me, you can see the row values on uh, temperature and oxygen on the left and the model result on the right. It was very unexpected, but I found this negative relationship between temperature and oxygen with fish growth, and this was significant at about 300 meters and 400 meters. I'm not 100% sure about how to explain this. I'm still working on it. These are just some preliminary data. And I mean, we know that these fishes move up and down, even though we do not know uh, the, exactly like how this varies with seasons or how this varies with hypoxia or not hypoxia. But one reason for this might be that basically the fish moves up, maybe, when there's more oxygen in the water, the less oxygen in the water column, and then the the, they might find better condition for growth, maybe more food or more visibility. It's still like there's not so much that we know about the distribution of these fishes, but yeah, I'm still I'm working on this. And just 
a quick mention because when we talk about growth, we need to talk about food. I haven't included this in the model yet. This is the zooplankton data for several of the years that we have. I've not included it yet because uh, we don't have it for all the years, so I need to find a way to use it into the data. But we can see that there is not that big of a difference between the years. But I'm really looking forward to put this into the model and find a way to, to deal with it. So just summarizing, growth was mostly driven by this allometric effect of age, which was understandable. We found a temporal, uh, temporal trend given by both ear and cord effect on the growth of this of the species, and there's an apparent negative effect at increasing temperature and oxygen, about 300 meters and 400 meters, which I'm still, I would like to get feedbacks from you about this, if you have any idea. So yeah, maybe the fish moves up and avoid epoxia, or maybe the problem is me, so I need to find a better way to characterize the fjord environment. At the moment, I only have the environmental variables on the time that the fish was caught, even though we know that in the fjords at great depths, basically the condition is quite kind of steady throughout the year, so I wouldn't expect big variations between oxygen and temperature um, during, uh, during the same year. And also maybe I need to find a better way to characterize the fish environmental situation because again, if this fish moves up and down, and we know that often they're also distributed by size, then maybe I can find a way to relate the to use the environmental variables at the depth that is more relevant for the size class or the age of the fish. I don't know, I'm working on that. So yeah, if you have any feedbacks, it's more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I also had a timer. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, is there any feedback from the audience to the questions? No? Yes. It's me again, the non-expert. Uh, when you say they, they move to avoid hypoxia, it is, is there any direction specific or, or like where do you go? Like, Oh, it was mostly like moving upwards for, so they follow, we know that, I mean, this is more like Martinez will present afterwards, but uh, they, they have this kind of light comfort zone, so they move up and down basically during day and night. And the idea is that, yeah, maybe if there is, the, the, the oxygen went quite low, down to 1.5 uh, milligram per liter during the 2016, 17 time. So the idea is mostly that they move up, because I think that the, and I go correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the hypoxia in the basin water was kind of consistent throughout the fjord. So it was horizontal movement was probably not very helpful. So it's moving upwards. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Francesco. Uh, I know you also have uh, measurements of actual fish size from at least part of this time series. Uh, do you see the overall actual size of benthazema in terms of the mean individual length also longer and the condition factor greater during this period when you see the otolith data pointing to faster growth? Yeah, I think so. But I think I presented something similar related with the length in Liège last year, and I, I did see an increase in actually in the size of the fish. So what I think that what I want to do here, and the reason why I'm using the increments rather than the length, is that because then you are able to see the length is just the final product, basically, what you get when you catch the fish. While when you, see, when you look at the increments, you can actually follow that fish for its entire life and trying to understand what happened. But yeah, I, th I think that the signal from the length is actually consistent to what we see here. Okay, and thank you to all the speakers, to you and to everybody in the afternoon. And we now break for 30 minutes coffee and then hopefully see you all back here at, uh, in half an hour at 3.30, exactly. So we will start the last part of this deoxygenation session now. So we will have four talks. Uh, the first one will be online and then we will have a discussion of half an hour. Uh, we have prepared uh, some points to discuss about the UN Decade Good Program, but also about scientific topics that are worth to discuss in relation to deoxygenation. And we will move now to the next speaker. Vili Tepe. Is it more or less correct? It's yeah, almost that's okay. there, yeah. More or less, yeah. And uh, it's still Argo. 
So it's using Argo data to improve uh, oxygen projection in ecosystem models. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Veli Çağlar Yunuktepe, and I'm a researcher at the NASA Center in Bergen here. And I'm part of the ocean modeling group. And yeah, I will be talking about Argos and mostly on the models. Um, so this work is part of the Auto Ocean project, which is funded by Birkner Center, again in Bergen. So in summary, the project is on. So the climate models underestimate the oxygen decline uh, in the oceans, and our objective is to identify why. Um, and we present regional solutions for improved oxygen uh, projections. And we use observations and a suite of uh, models ranging from a 1D column, water column model to regional and global models, and we try to identify the errors in oxygen. Today I will be focusing on a 1D model, but its improvements will benefit the regional and global models. Now, I wasn't sure if I need to put this here, but anyway, so the Argos drift at a certain depth, they descend, and they, take, uh, they ascend towards the surface, taking data, send the data to satellite, and then descend back to their drifting depth. And BGC Argo is the ones that are equipped with uh, these sensors for chlorophyll, oxygen, uh, suspended particles, nitrate, pH, and downwelling irradiance. So I put this figure here to emphasize how well BGC Argo uh, complement the in-situ data uh, from the cruises. They are mainly located in the offshore, and it's, they present data from uh, throughout the year. And together, they give a very good uh, regional coverage of the Nordic Seas, and which is important for uh, model uh, validation. And equally important is the, uh, the, the resolution, the vertical and temporal resolution of Argo data. So you can see an example one from the Lofoten uh, basin. And if you look at the surface chlorophyll, and the, the markers are the satellite chlorophyll, which has gaps in the data due to cloud cover. But Argos provide information that uh, the satellites couldn't capture. And more importantly, of course, they provide data below the surface, important things such as uh, deep chlorophyll maximum. And they come with in additional variables. Here's an example one, oxygen. And yeah, you can see the variability in the deeper layers as well. So because of this, Ar uh, this Argo data set is valuable for validating and improving the models. So in this talk, I will be mainly talking on a framework that I have developed, and it actually makes it easy to build 1D modeling experiments along the BGC Argo track. So it's a water column uh, model, not at a fixed location, but they try to imitate, imitate what the Argo sees. And they use both physics and biogeochemical data from the Argos. And in essence, what it does is it takes temperature and salinity, and they nudge the model physics closer to the observations. And with um, stronger nudging, the model better imitate the uh, Argo temperature and, and salinity. That improves the timing and the strength of mixed layer depth, which in turn improves the timing and strength of spring uh, bloom, which is important for the Nordic Seas. So in summary, the model errors in physics is reduced. So we have a better focus on the ecosystem model. And then we use BGC Argo data, biogeochemical data, to validate the model and then do model improvements. I use Gotham physics model, which is a 1D model, and Fabum coupler, which takes information from the physics model to the biogeochemical model, that is ECOSMO. And ECOSMO is an intermediate complexity, lower trophic level uh, model. It's mainly used as the Arctic operational biogeochemical model in Copernicus. And this framework was used successfully, I think, for chlorophyll previously. And the chlorophyll data from the Argos was used to give a good statistical analysis of our model uh, chlorophyll. So this is the error map of these models. And you can see that with the Argo, we were able to identify the shortcomings of the model, and we did some improvements on it. And now the model better represents this lower, uh, the better spring volume and uh, better deep chlorophyll maximum. So the model of chlorophyll is in a better shape. And I will move on to oxygen now. But before I move on to the remaining slides, I need to say a few things on the 1D models. This is oxygen, by the way, and along the same Argo track as the chlorophyll I just showed. So 1D models are, I think, uh, quite necessary. And um, they are fast, they are cheap, they, you can run numerous of them, so you can, you know, experiment with your models prior to 3D uh, experiments, which is quite expensive. But they have limitations, mostly in the physics. 
For example, here, as, as the Argo goes uh, on its track, it encounters a different water mass, and it's highly likely that we won't be able to represent that in, in a 1D study, or possible lateral interactions, or the variability in the deeper layers. But with, what we can control is mainly the upper layer dynamics, such as primary production, grazing, uh, organic matter formation and its decomposition, or ARC interactions. So as I go through the slides, please keep in mind that there are things I can control here, and there are things that I'm limited with. And uh, so models are highly sensitive to biogeochemical parameters, and we <clears throat> often rely on predefined set of uh, parameter values, which we sometimes need to improve. And the aim of this work is to do an objective analysis and fine-tune model parameterization uh, using an ensemble approach. So, so before the one I, example I gave you on was only focusing on one Argo track, I increased the number here to four to cover more regions in the Nordic seas. And I selected 44 parameters from ECOSMO, mainly focusing on productivity and organic matter. And I created a ensemble, uh, an ensemble of uh, experiments with different parameter values. So each parameter alone is ranged with 30 values within minus 30 to plus 30 percent of its reference value. So at the end, each Argo track, for example, here has 1,320 sub-experiments. So I have four Argos, more than 5,000 experiments. And that makes the, the sampling set for the statistical analysis. And with the statistical analysis, we try to identify the sub-experiment that best represents Argo, chlorophyll, and oxygen, and that experiment will be the <clears throat> improved uh, model parameter set, let's say, so that we can take it to 3D. Um, <clears throat> so in, along one experiment, well, all of them, we, I take the, the model results, and the Argo profiles are interpolated to model depths. I take statistics, bias, error, correlation, and uh, standard deviation. You can see the how the statistics look for one particular Argo. X-axis is error, Y-axis is bias. Top colors are uh, correlation, and this is colors here are standard deviation. And among these hundreds of exper experiments, you can see that some are doing well with, in terms of statistics, some are not that well, so some of them are doing quite well here. Low bias, low error for chlorophyll, low bias, low error for oxygen. But the thing is, it's, um, it's hundreds of experiments here, four of them, and it makes a thousands of experiments, so which one is to pick? Is, and I haven't settled on a, a technique yet. I'm still working on this, but what I'm doing now is to take the better half of each statistical item and make a subgroup and see if this group appear in, the, in all of the Argos. So I try to filter the experiments. And luckily, I end up with a handful of experiments Here's an example one, 1293. And take the reference model run, so this is oxygen error here, and this is the oxygen concentration along the Argo track, and this is how we can compare to the new selected experiment, and this is Argo oxygen. Um, you can see some improvements, for especially here, late summer, the, the, the decrease in oxygen concentration is more pronounced, more, is more agreeing with the Argo, and the peak in oxygen in, in spring volume is less, uh, again, in agreement with the, the Argo. It's still not a perfect model, and there, are, there is still room for improvements, especially in the spring volume. I still need to decrease the oxygen concentration, maybe focus on uh, productivity dynamics. Also, the decrease in oxygen in summer, late summer should be more pronounced. Maybe I should uh, focus more on organic matter decomposition or uh, particle sinking rates. Um, what else? Yes. But as I said previously, that this is a 1D modeling study, and you need to keep in mind that there are limitations, and how much of this error can be constrained in a 1D model is another question. So a conclusive result can be, we can make it in a 3D model, so that we can include lateral interactions, or we have more control on uh, deep layer uh, circulation. And I should note that there are experiments that did better in terms of oxygen than this one. The thing is I cannot only focus on oxygen. Uh, it's, a, it's a full biogeochemical model, so I, uh, other variables are equally important. So this, this one here is more like, it also did successfully in terms of chlorophyll. So the better uh, it does with other variables, it's, it's going to be my prior choice. Um, 
Yes. As a take-home message, I should say that so BGCR will present an alternative and effective data set for model validation and development two ways. I will repeat myself here again. I use the Argo temperature, uh, physics data to uh, improve the model physics, so reducing errors in uh, model, uh, reducing error in physics, so that I reduce the errors in biology. And I use Argo biochemical data to do an objective analysis, so that I can improve the uh, the model. As for conclusions. The models are the only tools we have uh, to predict how uh, climate change will drive the deoxygenation. And it is vital to understand the limitations of our models so that we can improve. And in this study, model parameters are objectively analyzed using an ensemble approach along the BGC Argo tracks in the Nordic seas. So try to uh, improve the parameter set. And next steps are increase the number of BGC Argo tracks, so increase our uh, sampling data set. In, include more variables from the Argos so that I increase the variable set and evaluate uh, for evaluate a statistical analysis. Maybe there's a better way that I can filter uh, the successful models. Of course, whatever I do here is always towards 3D and improve uh, the, the better parameter set will be applied in 3D so that we have a better, uh, hopefully better representation of uh, 3D models. Uh, and then we can better evaluate the sources of errors. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, really. Any question? I want to try to adjust in 1D. Don't you think that maybe the parameter said that you're going to derive is compensating for physical processes which are not there. So even if it's better for the 1D when you will plug in the 3D? Have you yes. So the thing is, I'm, that's one of the reasons why I should increase the number of Argos to cover more regions. And there are, it, I want it to be more generic. So the more generic, the more generic it is, the better it will work in 3D. And it was it would be too detailed to put here, but there are actually with the Argos fundamental differences, errors in the model that I can improve, no matter whether it's a 1D or 3D. But with parameter tuning, you're right. Yes, that can be an over-tuning towards 1D. But this will be tested in 3D as well. And uh, I, I can see that, for example, if there's a massive spring balloon, I mean, the, the better I represent that, is, I, I'm, I'm sure that it will better behave in 3D as well. Uh, I need to check that in 3D as well, and you have a point there. And that kind of can be a shortcoming of this approach, but I still have belief in sure. this. You, you could have chosen to use a downgraded version of your 3D model. But, uh, but I, as you see, I, I could manage thousands of experiments here in one day, so still it's a cost-effect thing. Mm. Yeah, okay. I, This can be run on a laptop. You prefer, if, OK. Yeah. Any other question? I have another one yeah. about the source of errors in your models. So you, you focus on the biogeochemical parameters. Mm -hmm. So which other source do you have in mind that are important if you have to make some ensemble experiments? So apart from bio... bio Apa apart from biological parameters. So you mean physics? Uh, the physics, I don't know. The, the river, the atmosphere? Or... Um, there is air sea interactions. So uh, it's, it's not highly tight. It's not like very detailed tied to the... Like it is tight, but I mean, it also has a physical control on the, the air sea interactions. And I think we, we will need to look at that as well how fast the, the exchange of oxygen, especially in the winter time, from the model water column towards the atmosphere or back the and forth. So, yeah. yeah, things like that. So we need, I think we need to look at how much there is exchange, and this is beyond uh, uh -huh. next to biochemistry. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, any chance to ask on a last question? No question? Okay, so thank, thank you. you very much, Vaili. So we move to the next speaker. It's uh, Echayo Guo. Yeah? Uh, and so you will speak about can oxygen utilization rate be used to track long term change of aerobic respiration in the mesopelagic zone? Yeah, thanks for introducing me. and. Uh, Hi everyone, I'm Hachao and I'm from uh, Juma. It's, uh, 
yeah, I'm from Juma, and uh, today I'm very glad to share my recent work in this very nice symposium. Um, the topic of the talk is kind of mutization rates uh, tracks long-term trend of mesoplastic respiration. And I would like to thank my um, colleagues in Juma, Iris Christ, and Jess Oshilis, and Wolfgang Koh for their great contributions uh, to this work. Uh, first, I want to introduce some, sorry. Motivation? Motivation to this, uh, uh, this research? No work? Oh, yeah, it works. Sorry, uh, break it through. Uh, yeah, first I would like to introduce uh, the motivations of this research, and perhaps all the audience has, has already know that uh, the dissolved oxygen concentration in the ocean is declining, and these processes, the ocean deoxygenation, is widely regarded as a new stressor for the ecosystems. And IPCC model project that uh, um, these processes unfortunately will continue, and by the end of this century, about three to four percent of the oxygen in the ocean will be lost. However, we need to know that there's still some mismatch between model simulations and observations. So observations show that from 1960s to 2010s, about two percent of the oxygen in the ocean uh, has been has been lost. But that value in the model simulations is around 0.6 percent. And this mismatch might indicate that some ocean deoxygenation mechanisms are not well simulated in the current Earth's models yet. And these mechanisms include decreasing solubility, decreasing ventilation, and possible changes for the respiration or oxygen consumption rates. And getting some ideas about uh, how the oxygen consumption rates respond to the climate change will help us to uh, understand ocean deoxygenation processes better. And here I introduce one method which has potential ability to reconstruct the temperature changes with respiration in the past decades. And this method is called Oxygen Utilization Reads, OUR. In these green books, I show how the OUR is calculated. It's very simple, actually. So first, we calculate apparent oxygen utilization, which is the difference between saturated oxygen and measured oxygen. So it provides some information about how many oxygen is consumed from the source region to the sample region. And the OUR is just the, gradient, the ratio of the gradient of AOU and the gradient of the age. Now, the age of the water is defined as how long the water leaves the surface ocean. And to better explain this OUR concepts and provide a schematic plot here, and you can see usually above the mixing layer, we have very efficient ERC gas exchange, and the saturation of the oxygen is usually close to 100%. And when this surface water moved down to the ocean interior, uh, first the age increase and also the oxygen is consumed because of the respiration always happens and the AOU increases. And if you plot the age and AOU, it looks like this and the, and the, sorry, and the, the, the slope, uh, this is the slope of the AOU versus age provides some information about how uh, the local oxygen consumption rates. And our key question is to understand whether under changing climate scenario, OUR is a good proxy to track the long-term trend of mesoplastic respiration. And we address this issue, use the Earth system model simulations. This Earth system model is called FORSA. It's currently developing in Juma. The several papers have been published about this model. And we calculate the OUR as a proxy of oxygen consumption rates in this model ocean. The ideal, uh, we use the idealized age tracer that's simulated in this foresight to provide the age uh, information. And the other crucial variables we used in this study is true respiration, which, which is defined as the oxygen consumption rates from degradations of the detritors and dissolved organic matter at each grid box in the model ocean. I need to clarify here that all calculations is done in the model ocean. We do not refer to any real ocean properties. So the true expression here functions like a ground truth 
to evaluate the OUR method. And we take the OUR and true aspiration integral from 200 meters to 1,000 meters, which is defined as a mesoplasm. To get the climate change signal, we have two simulations. One is pre-industrial control simulations, in which we do not have any uh, anthropogenic effects. And the other one is, tr is transient simulations, in which we have the carbon dioxide emission from human activities, and also for the future, we have the high carbon dioxide emission scenario. And we do the analysis for the transient manners, uh, pre-industrial control simulations to, to extract the, the climate change signal. As as a ah uh, no, so it looks looks it should be different. But anyway, I, I chose two sections. That is in the North Atlantic, one is in the North Atlantic subtropic gyre, one is in the South Atlantic subtropic gyre. It's well, I have the map as a background, but uh, okay. Uh, they suffer from decreasing uh, uh, in, in increasing stratifications and uh, decreasing export production, so the respiration should decrease here. And here are some results in the, for example, in the, uh, uh, as the beginning of the North Atlantic section, the red line is the true aspiration, the blue line is OUR, and the thick line is transient simulation results and the blue line, uh, and the, uh, the, the dash line is pre-industrial control simulations. And so you can see that the mesoplagic integral of OUR is approximately only half of the integrated true aspiration rates. And also, with climate change, both integrated true aspiration and integrated OUR decrease. And here, I show the vertical, dis vertical distributions of OUR and true aspiration. The shading color here is the standard deviation. And you can see that OUR is systematically smaller than true aspirations over the whole mesoplastic zone. And also most of the difference occur in the upper ocean. And this phenomenon is not only happening in this model, but in other independent model studies as well. Uh, but if you, if you want to um, get more details about that, why we have this difference, uh, I would refer the paper from Kofan Keller that published in GBC. And our main primary, uh, our, our um, main target is to see whether OUR is a good proxy to track the climate change signal. And here's the climate change signal, and you can see that uh, the OUR and true expression both decrease with very similar magnitude. And here the plus minus value is the 95% uh, confidence intervals, and the, uh, the, OUR, the slope of uh, true expression and OUR overlaps. So we can statistically we can see that uh, integrated OUR is able to track the long-term trend of uh, true aspiration in the North Atlantic section. And however, OUR performs very differently in the South Atlantic section where the dynamics are very complicated. And uh, uh, first, uh, the true aspiration OUR integral in the South Atlantic section is very similar, which seems to be a good news, but in fact, it's it's actually not. I will introduce more later. Uh, and also the integrated true aspiration decrease, the red line, uh, the red line decrease, but OUR increase. That is a huge problem if, uh, because they have the divergent trend. And even though the OUR integral and the uh, true aspiration have very similar uh, values here, but they show very different vertical patterns. And true aspiration decrease almost like a power law of the depths, which is like a like Martin curve. And the OUR shows very, very complicated worse, uh, vertical patterns, which is totally different with local respiration rates. And that is because, perhaps because the mixing between different source water types here. Um, and yeah, that is the possible reasons. Unfortunately, we cannot prove this in the transient ocean. And here are the results, uh, the climate change signal. Uh, again, the, 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 slope, the sign of the slope is different. So one increase, one decrease. So if you use OUR and, uh, and, and regard it as a true aspiration uh, 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 signal, then we might have some problems there. And also the correlation coefficient between OUR integral and true aspiration integral is pretty low. It's only uh, uh, minus 0.19. So Statistically, we can see that we can see that integrated OUR shows very poor relationship uh, with integrated true aspiration rates in the South uh, in, in the South Atlantic section. 
And so clearly there must be some other drivers except uh, local respiration rates which make OUR, uh, OUR changes with climate change. And here I provide two possible reasons. So here I show the schematic plot again. Um, so assume that we, research, we, we calculate OUR in this, in this red box. And with climate change, we know the ocean circulation might changes, and source water types or water masses composition might change in this study region. And that might modify the age and AOU relationships and make OUR different uh, changes change with, with, uh, uh, with time. And the other possible reason is not only in this research area we have the climate change, but in all ocean area we have the climate change signal. This remote biogeochemical responses to climate change might be mapped into the research area by the mixing, so that also impacts all your values with climate change. And conclusions, so OUR integrity has potential ability to reconstruct the uh, respiration rates integral in parts of the Mesopelagic Ocean, like what we see in the North Atlantic area. However, in other parts of the Mesopelagic uh, Ocean, uh, the temperature trends signals from OUR can be, uh, can be a very unreliable indicator of, of, uh, of, of trends in true respiration. That is because uh, the OUR contains not only the local respiration information, but the mixing can induce some uh, biochemical histories from outside of the research section. And if we want to get the, um, the true respiration uh, trend, we need to get, uh, we, need, uh, we might require accurate knowledge of the mixing induced age and AUU in the transient ocean. And to my knowledge, that is still very hard to, to solve. And by saying this, I would like to say that uh, this, this, uh, the work here is, uh, is online now. If you are interested in the code or the scripts or technique details, you, you can simply scan the QR code here to the preprint. And by seeing this, I would like to thank for the attention and open for any questions. Thank you very much. Question? <laughs> yes. Okay. A really interesting talk. So in the subsurface ocean, we find a really good correlation between oxygen, pH, and other carbon parameters. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, I'm trying to understand how well is your respiration estimated. It has been really hard to do so. Uh, so what, you have the good relationship with pH or what, oh, sorry? Between pH and oxygen. Okay. It's so, uh, really rock solid in the subsurface ocean. Mm -hmm. And basically, we assume the primary process is re respiration. And you know, as we know, respiration is really hard to estimate accurately. Mm -hmm, yes. So you use that as a basis. I mean, how well did you? Yeah, yeah, this model is very simple models because okay. everything is calculated in the model ocean. So uh, this respiration here is only depends on the uh, concentrations of the, uh, the detractors and dissolved organic matter that simulated in this model. We do not even have the temperature uh, uh, effects on the, metabol uh, on the metabolic uh, metabolisms. So it's, it's a very simple model, but it's still useful. We just want to see, uh, understand some, some uh, rough uh, mechanisms uh, in the OUR concepts. So we do not include every process in these true respiration simulations, unfortunately. All right. Thank yeah. you so much. Sorry. Other question? Um, I have a question. You simulate dynamically the age of the water yes. in your model. Okay. Yes. So it's, uh, and in your climate simulation, your long simulation, you also simulate it explicitly in the two conditions. Uh, basically, they have the same initial condition. Everything is the same, just the carbon dioxide emission is different. So. But the, 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 the atmospheric forcing is different, no? In yes. The transient? Okay. Yes. For the age, okay. And uh, yeah, and uh, there is a question about the assessment, the difference, the, discrepan the discrepancy between the model and the observation in terms of the oxygenation trend. And you want to investigate if it's the respiration given by the model that is um, 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Under it's debated. So how this study uh, uh, helps yeah, to yeah, understand yeah. that? Because so this, you speak true respiration. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This this is uh, because in the real ocean they use OUR try to estimate yeah. the true respirations, and uh, because Belgium came with the ecosystem response to the climate change right? and uh, the respiration map changes, but it's very hard to measure it. And there's one method OUR uh, because we measure a lot of the CFCs. We have. Uh, ability to calculate OUR in past few decades at least. And if it works in some parts of the ocean, we can get some ideas about how uh, uh, calculate OUR in the real ocean and get some trend in, uh, that, uh, that in that area. So that might contribute to um, our understanding on what is happening in the oxygen in the real ocean as well. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, it shows well, sometimes it works, sometimes not. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes? Yeah. Oh, yes. So, uh, are you comparing the OUR to just the local respiration rate? Yes. Or are you, so you're not integrating over any sort of travel path? No, we do not. Um, because the OUR gradient, uh, the gradient of the uh, AOU, uh, AOU versus the gradient of the H should equal to the local respiration, so we do not... Well, so a AOU and, and OUR will have the signal of basically the average respiration rate along the path of a parcel. No, that, that is the not gradient. A if you use AOU divided by the H, that is the integrated signal. Right. Yes. So, so not the local signal. It's, it's local signal. If you use the gradient, if you use gradient... Oh, I see. Not, is, not a delta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, so there, there may still be, you know, some aliasing in the method. Uh, have you looked at like integrating over a broader area? Yes, we use and, that. But, and do you get a better agreement? Yeah, but 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 the thing is, if you if you, for example, we do that in one Belms Belms province, which is kind of larger. But the thing is, the age and EU, uh, age and AUU is not very linear. The R square is very very low. So that is because it contains a lot of different source waters, which have very different biochemical histories. So it's hard to, unfortunately, to my knowledge, it's hard to do that in in, in large area. Okay, yeah. So you. yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> oh. so. so now we move to the discussion. And uh, so for the discussion, we, we have decided with the other conveners. Uh, to present you, just try to stay here, some of you. Okay, but just before you leave, do not forget to, to take your badge to go on the boat, because the organizer asked me to inform you, you just have to have your badge, otherwise you will not be accepted on the board. Okay, so now we have the discussion, and so for the discussion, we have decided to show you uh, the uh, presentation of the UN Decade uh, Good Program, which is the Global Ocean Oxygen Program that has been uh, endorsed by the UN Decade. Uh, and so for that, we will uh, ask uh, Andreas, Andreas Oschlis, who is the PI of this uh, Global Ocean Oxygen Decade Program, to present you in two slides. So it will be very short. What are the main activities and the objective of that program? And then we will move to a uh, description of an initiative that we have in the frame of this program and a survey that you will invite you to, to, to fill in uh, for some um, uh, information that, that we try to collect about observing oxygen in the ocean. So, okay, first, Andreas? Yeah. Thank you very much, Marilou. Uh, so this is uh, the yeah, Global Ocean Oxygen Decade. It's a program of the UN Ocean Decade, and it's called GOOD, uh, for obvious re reasons. Um, we also have, uh, an, uh, well, it, it, it was developed by an earlier uh, UNESCO IOC working group, uh, Global Ocean Oxygen Network, called GON, uh, but we think GOOD is more appropriate for this decade. Um, so, and Marilor and Kirsten are here as well, uh, co-leading this effort, and we have uh, Paul, maybe somewhere, who is helping us with the secretariat uh, to, to manage operations. So what is all this about? Well, it's, it's about, well, better, uh, well, understanding, developing our understanding of ocean deoxygenation. Ocean goes really to the coasts, because the ocean, UN decade is about uh, sustainability 
and that affects society. And just see what I can. Maybe I move this here. All right, not, not in the way. I hope this works. Uh, so, so this is uh, well, an, increasing our knowledge, the scientific understanding. So what is the, the causes, impacts, uh, and of course threats, threats to society, threats to, to um, well, environmental factors that eventually affect society. That's what the UN Ocean Decade is about. And uh, we need increased capacity to, to observe what is going on, to measure things. Uh, this particularly along the coasts where we, uh, well, we, we have a lot of data which are not always available. And uh, we have to be able to monitor changes, to document this, and to communicate it, to make it transparent. What are the impacts to make to raise awareness of this? Uh, this will require indicators. We have uh, like water management indicators. A lot, a lot of things exist, uh, and we would like to to make this well, be able to quantify uh, impacts, threats, and ongoing changes of ocean oxygen. Uh, and this will then be, well, can be taken up by agencies and can be done in some operational way, which is not, has not to be driven by research, the community, but has to, uh, can be continued elsewhere by other financial resources as well, financial and human resources. And uh, uh, we want and we think we need, once we have understood the full threat and the full breadth of the, the impacts, um, well, uh, mechanisms to either um, adapt, well, either mitigate, that's the best option, of course, and where mitigation is not possible to adapt to changes, and this will be done in close, uh, or has to be done in close collaboration with the, uh, well, communities, with local communities, local stakeholders that often have a lot of knowledge uh, which has not been transported into the scientific realm, like fishermen know a lot about oxygen changes, historical changes, and this is a bi-directional joint effort really to, to develop uh, actionable strategies to cope and, well, hopefully mitigate, mitigate uh, ocean deoxygenation. So these are the objectives. Activities, we have a number of activities. Uh, they, they start with activities directed uh, or targeting society. Uh, so, so identifying threats make this uh, well, uh, make society aware of uh, threats of ocean deoxygenation. People know ocean warming, ocean acidification, but not so much ocean deoxygenation. So we think that is, uh, if, well, if it really is a threat, that's a scientific question as well, and a societal question. We have to make people aware of this and uh, understand the threats. That is the first, uh, first activity that we have to do. And then, uh, well, look at indicators that can describe this and also monitor and make changes transparently avail uh, well, visible. Um, then value um, the, well, benefits of having oxygen in the ocean compared to a situation where we lose oxygen in the ocean. So that is, is a, well, social value and economic value and uh, basically has to measure the ocean services and that's another activity we have to transport in this ocean decade to make this connection society to ocean science. Um, then we can go to, well, other stresses. We have still have warming and acidification, of course, sea level rise and, uh, and other climate changes, particularly in coastal areas, also coming from land runoff and, uh, and, and pollution. Uh, and, well, look at all these societal and economic the blue economy consequences. Once we have all that, then we go to the last item, section items. That's more of the scientific part. That's where we have already ongoing scientific projects, improving our understanding of causes, attributing changes that we see, and uh, also developing measures, possible measures, what could be done to mitigate ocean deoxygenation. This involves that section item number seven, mapping and modeling ocean oxygen for our projections into the future under different scenarios. And there we have an uh, activity already, a project, uh, UN Decade project, uh, GLODAT, a Global uh, Ocean Oxygen Atlas and Database. That's also led by Marie-Laure and uh, Veronique Garçon. 
And we have finally capacity building and ocean literacy. So that's needed to really make this bi-directional ex exchange uh, of knowledge between stakeholders, local communities, and our global scientific community most fruitful. That's what we, uh, well, wrote in the proposal. That's about one and a half years ago, or two, almost two years ago. And that's where we, what we have set up as our, well, activity. How do we do this? Uh, there's little uh, to zero funding to do this. <laughs> and, uh, so we have a lot of uh, well, um, optimism, power, and feel engaged and feel, well, responsible to improve the situation here. And that's what drives us and what drives many of you, I think, otherwise we wouldn't be here. And now we want to connect to you and see what can we done, what, what can we do jointly to, to address these uh, actions and what can we do here? One thing, do you want to continue? Should I? This is, I think, glowed up this activity. That's one of essential part where we can certainly achieve a lot since we have all these data, local data, national data, and then local coastal waters, which are not always or not generally openly available. So we need those to map historical developments and also improve the database make it operational into the future to monitor changes and to really know the state of the system. And this can be improved pretty, well, theoretically it can be improved very easily. There's politics involved, there's uh, history involved, and we have to jointly overcome these boundaries, and that's the item of, uh, of GLODAT, really to ensure we have a stable database, it's quality control is an issue here, that we really have the firm basis for uh, the, to answer questions about the problem of ocean deoxygenation. And, well, you can find uh, a, a, there's a survey uh, which should motivate you to well, first participate, but then also to think about where do we have data that are not in these global databases already and, and that you can provide and to, or make connections to to improve our firm, well, essential base for our work for understanding, improvement, and for finding solutions uh, together with you, with the stakeholders that also may have data, and with the, the communities, particularly in coastal areas, that are really concerned or should be concerned about ocean deoxygenation. Thanks for your attention. That's the brief uh, introduction. And now we I think, have a, well, time for questions. Ideas. Is there any question on the presentation? You know, this is, uh, as you know, I sort of do now for something very different kind of things. And um, so when I looked at your survey, I saw there was no place for me in there because I don't use, um, I generally don't use direct DO measurements, but we do get a lot of information from these biological markers. And it occurred to me, I was just thinking about the fact that there have been uh, sort of uh, community-based um, surveys where people have done studies of like looking at how another element called strontium works as a marker for movement in and out of different um, waters and found that marine fish are very different from freshwater and diadromous fish, for instance. So, you know, I could imagine um, that in our communities of biomarkers, as it were, we could mount something similar to that um, where we could do a lot of surveys, ask people to mail us in their, um, their materials, their otoliths, their eye lenses, whatever, and we could analyze them. All we need is money, you know, but um, we, could we might be able to find it, but it might be another supplement because uh, fish and shellfish do, do, see, do observe in ways that we can't, you know. So it's just a thought. Uh, 
what are the limitations uh, everywhere in the world. So that's really the idea. It's not to receive the data, that's mm -hmm. what I mean. It's more to know how people uh, do it practically to measure oxygen. That's the idea of the survey. But it's, it's also a good point, and, and, and there's another slide here for other activities that we can start, and, and, and this having these like proxy information uh, might be another very useful uh, source of information that uh, can, can help us better understanding what has happened in the past, but might also provide an, a, a different, uh, well, a parallel uh, additional link to, into society, to stakeholders, to see, to, to well, judge uh, the, the impact of ocean deoxygenation on services the ocean provides. Maybe, uh, could you put up the slide where you had all of the different things under good? Just read this one, yeah. Maybe we could just uh, hear, con yeah, uh, maybe we could just hear from the community about if there are things that in your research network or in your research program that contribute to these goals that you're already working on that you would like to share because you know the decade is through 2030, it's 2023, we're moving very closely to the outcomes of these programs and so we don't have that much time um, to accomplish a lot of really lofty goals and so it'd be great to hear what type of work is already happening um, that supports uh, these goals. Well, I do have some regional data to contribute, but my, uh, but I really have a question about what you had in mind about mitigation. Are you talking about just in the very near coastal zone in areas where anthropogenic eutrophication is the main cause, or like giant egg beaters in the open ocean? Mm -hmm. well, what sort of things have you, yeah. have you had ideas? Thanks. About? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting point. So when we started all this, the main idea was to well to to understand the causes. Right now, that's well, global warming and eutrophication, particularly in coastal areas, but also in re remote areas via atmospheric deposition um, of nitrous oxide, for example. Um, so, so then the first mitigation measure would be to, to stop global warming in an ideal world and uh, stop eutrophication uh, and uh, nutrient pollution. It's also uh, organic matter uh, uh, pollution. Now there are also ideas uh, to reoxygenate ocean areas and, and part of these ideas come from uh, green hydrogen production where companies uh, have lots of leftover oxygen suddenly when they do electrolysis. Uh, so far they usually vent it into the atmosphere so, uh, or maybe they sell a few amounts to, to, to respirators and so on but, but it's, it's huge amounts. It's, it's 8 kilogram oxygen per kilogram of hydrogen and, and the first uh, companies that run electrolyzers uh, have approached us to, to, to see, can it be used? And so far, we, we haven't made up our minds. So well, we have done a few modeling studies uh, with some aspects of what could go wrong. Uh, and uh, there are a number of things that can go wrong, as you can expect. Uh, but, but that's something that will come into our community we will be asked, uh, and, and, um, and maybe it's not, not always uh, stupid to, to reject it right away, uh, since uh, particularly if you have, um, well, fish farming, aquaculture, uh, where you can have huge economic uh, losses if you have uh, short periods of low oxygen waters, it might be an option to use part of the oxygen that is produced in electrolysis. Uh, to, to provide a more stable environment that might be more in the direction of pre antigenic ocean, but it's a scientific challenge to, to provide, well, risk assessment, uh, life cycle assessments, and all, all these approaches that I think we need uh, to, we are now confronted with. And that's a very novel development that wasn't, I, I haven't, hadn't heard when we started the ocean decade, but uh, there's, well, of course, huge momentum, huge money, uh, financial resources involved, and, uh, and many thing people want to do, want to help. 
and uh, we, we have to, to make sure that uh, science is not too far behind <laughs> what is going on there. Yeah, this is for uh, maybe item number seven on, on this list. Uh, and whether you think there is a framework for maybe an intermodel comparison that has to deal with resolution and identifying the biases that we're basing a lot of the projections on, uh, should that be a priority? And whether in future CMIP 7, uh, how much to prioritize model resolution and the need to integrate uh, data? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So for the global models, well, we have the CMIP program, and, and uh, most, if not all, CMIP models have oxygen and have had it for a number of decades. Uh, people usually haven't looked that much into oxygen. Uh, the main emphasis on developing, when developing the model, was carbon and, and heat, um, and, and we we found that well, basically that model intercomparison project is is ongoing. And there are all models are pretty poor with respect to oxygen and observations. And there's a huge discrepancy, which is, uh, to my understanding, still unresolved. And we haven't been able, we have known it now for almost a decade, I would say. We haven't made much progress there in our understanding. And it's, it's really uh, good to have oxygen as a very sensitive tracer, apparently, or mostly probably of ocean transport things. Uh, the, it's, it, it, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about well, additional ocean model com intercomparison projects. I think CMIP is for the global models. It's, it's pretty good. Um, CMIP, of course, does not primarily address oxygen, but we have a good, good uh, environment there to standardize model output and, and do all that. Oxygen is not a prime variable. Not all models report it and store it and archive it. We should lobby to do that, and please all do that. Uh, you're not the only model that is wrong, <laughs> and so, so don't worry. Uh, but we, we, we have to make progress there. And, uh, but we also have to, to ensure that we get good databases good, um, to compare against, and quality control data with the right time flag to see uh, the, the changes going on over decades. And we also need, I think, um, abiotic transient tracers like CFCs, like Argon, uh, like uh, uh, SF6. And, and uh, or, uh, that is very, very helpful to disentangle biological and transport issues in this changing ocean. All, it's not rocket science, uh, but it has to be done. It might sound boring, but we, we really have a problem here. And if we don't, with, if there's a discrepancy factor two to three, as Hai Chao showed in one talk here, between the current CMIP models, uh, CMIP 6 is very similar to CMIP 5 there, uh, and observational estimates, we, we really have a problem and uh, should, should understand it. And it's a community effort, and uh, we need all decks on hand. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Just a few words about the, the coastal and the regional ocean. We do not have such a coordination for the simulation for the coastal and regional ocean, so it's more disparate. And when we have this uh, uh, cryosphere and ocean report, the stroke report that has been produced, we, we really feel that this coordination was not there. So the protocol for doing the simulation were less advanced in terms of coordination, I mean, uh, compared to the global ocean. So that's maybe something on which we can progress to have a coordination effort to simulate the, the coastal and regional ocean. Um, in Europe, for instance, we, we have the Copernicus, which is more short term, it's forecast, where we try to have a modeling of the regional European seas, and we try to have the same type of assessment of the quality of the products, but it's not the same scale. So we are not speaking about projection. Copernicus is only a few days ahead and a few decades back, but we are not speaking about climate projection. And for that, I guess that we really benefit for a similar uh, coordination as they have for the, for the global ocean, I think. And so I will stop here because I, I speak already a lot. And Laura wants to say something, and then uh, we have many people. So, Laura. Yeah, I felt compelled because I don't entirely agree with you. <laughs> so I do agree with the CFCs. Yes, <laughs> I do agree with the CFCs and the SF6. It used to be part of the CMIP, and it's not a standard output anymore, and I think it, it, we lost something there. 
Um, I agree with you that the models are not perfect and that they don't reproduce necessarily every like gradients that we have in the observations, uh, although I also agree with the observations, you know, they, they are very sparse. But what I do think is that we can still learn a lot from the models that we have. If we, and when I started, you know, 10 years ago working on deoxygenation, I was like, okay, my models are crap, what can I do with it? I, this is an impossible task, but actually I, 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 I think if we look at it in a right framework, we can actually find robust results across our models. It's just longitude, latitude, depth is not necessarily the right way of looking at our models. And it's, it's the way we're trying to connect it to data, but that might not be the right way. And maybe an oxygen framework might be more relevant because the OMZ or the oxygen gradients might not be exactly at the same place in the models, but they're still there. And so looking differently and thinking differently about our models, I think we can still learn a lot. I had to say it. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Uh, yeah? And then, yeah? Yeah. So we, yeah. Hi. Yeah, just a comment, really. It's just worth mentioning that in another um, UN Decade program called Coast Predict, we are looking at developing a something that might be a global coast solution model in comparison program. So you know, it's kind of a link to number seven at the bottom there and, and some connection between the two. You know that I'm in the steering committee of course, Predict. Oh, of course, oh yeah. And, 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 <laughs> we didn't meet in person, I guess. Oh yeah. Only yeah. online. But, uh, and we, we link with course, Predict. So good evening. But your comment is, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. So you are going to be here. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Valeria. I work at OGS in a, a, research, a research center in Italy, and I'm involved in the Copernicus Marine Service in the, in the Mediterranean Sea. And I would like um, only to highlight uh, a point that is um, the BGC Argo floats are, um, in my opinion, a crucial point to improve our models because they can be used uh, not only to tuning parameters as we have seen before, but also for uh, post-processing bias corrections and also to be uh, integrated in the model uh, through the uh, data simulation. So uh, for our work, uh, uh, it is very important to have um, high quality uh, checked uh, near real time product uh, uh, about biogeochemical ergo float. And uh, in general, uh, models are not perfect, but they are um, uh, improving <laughs> more and more, uh, thanks uh, also to the, the uh, high quality observations. And they can be uh, also connected, um, I, I mean, not uh, uh, only um, with the low trophic levels, but also uh, to food web, uh, web uh, models and high, higher trophic level models. So I think that can be very, very useful. Yeah, yeah. Also the reanalysis models. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, oxygen is certainly crucial for the high trophic level as well. So we have Lisa. So I, I'm Lisa Levin. Um, I'm a benthic oceanographer at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and I wanted to speak to, well, numbers one and possibly four. There's, um, there's quite a few different places in the ocean. I mostly focus on continental margins and the open ocean. where So there are places where there are observatories or long-term observing programs that have been measuring oxygen for a really long time and also some aspect of the ecosystem, either pelagic ecosystems or benthic ecosystems. So Southern California is one example, but the ONC Observatory in Canada is another. The Chileans have some really good long-term monitoring. The Peruvians have good monitoring. The, um, there's some in the Indian Ocean. And there's been rather little effort to coordinate the biological response to declining oxygen um, across globally, you know, and bring together the people who've been monitoring these things sometimes, t you know, uh, 10 years, but sometimes 75 years. So I think there's, there should be a place for everybody to come together, 
not from the physical perspective, but to better understand the oxygenation effects on ocean life, and that would, of course, then translate to ecosystem services and some other things, but, you know, uh, and, and also to compare different kinds of ecosystems and how they respond. But Linda, do you think that the DK is the right uh, place to try to do that? Because Possibly. You know, I mean, there's not a lot of time left, but I mean, even, you know, I don't know that I've ever been to a workshop where that was the focus, right? So, yeah, because yeah. you know, the DK, as you have understood, it's really depending on your good willingness. So with, with, with Veronique, just a few words, we launched this go to that, and we, we, we try to build a community, and thank you for all the people that could contribute to this project. And without this very small budget, but the people are really willing to contribute. So that's really the type of initiative that uh, we have tried to support this coordination and benefit for the, from the UNDK to launch this coordination from, yeah, and to organize workshops. That's maybe the impression. Uh, comments here, Vero, uh, Kirsten, and Karin, Vero? Now, I want to echo Andreas and Laura. I think uh, we don't have the model that are able to produce the data, but we know the data space, they might be wrong or a lot of uncertainty. So we need to progress on both sides. But I think it's not only the oxygen community because if we don't have the oxygen right, we don't have the carbon right, we don't have the nutrients right. So I, I think it's not only the oxygen community that really uh, we should embark, but the semi results, I mean, you know, it's. It's carbon with an oxygen profile, which is fully wrong. Yeah, yeah just um, echoing actually what Lisa said, I think we shouldn't stop at uh, identifying the chemical change, but also like really, I mean, in the end, what interests um, everybody is the money and is the life. So, and that is most, uh, that's definitely not uh, whether we have one micromole or uh, less or more of, of oxygen. So I think it's uh, really going there. And I hope that really as well when we have, when you and please also distribute this, the survey so that we identify where we have oxygen measurements. And then it's also for us and from secretariat supporting this group to identify if there are also other um, yeah, uh, ecosystem um, or marine life measurements. There are a lot of these uh, where you have long-time phytoplankton and zooplankton measurements uh, quite often related to these. But as you said, sometimes just they don't even make the connections in their own place. And so just connecting that, I think, um, should be one of the next steps as well we, we can follow. And then, um, yeah, we count on your support for that. Yeah. Yes, and we can all and you can all use this ocean decade umbrella to to lobby for funding to develop your initiatives and i think that's a can be used in a positive way as a huge support to when you approach people either normal funding agencies we have been talking to but also possibly these uh, electrolyzer uh, boom that is now with a lot of private money coming uh, so that, of course, we, we need ground truth information, data. We have to understand the connection, oxygen, biology, life, uh, ecosystem services. If we don't understand it, it, it would be very dangerous to, to play around with some aspects and hope for the best. And uh, that's not a, a normal way one should approach uh, problems. So I think there's, uh, there are opportunities. And here we have an umbrella, a framework that we can use that's not direct support, not no direct financial support, but it's an institutional support. And often that, that can be a lot of, well, if, it's, it's good to have, uh, have a, this additional asset when you do your lobbying work. And you should always please inform us uh, what, what is going on so that we can help to connect, to, to uh, um, provide more information if we, we know that and can link to other groups. And the last item, last, I, I wanted to say here, we, we have also a monthly, about monthly webinar series where we also try to, well, um, raise awareness among the scientific communities, mostly among scientists. We have one early career scientist, 20 minutes, one later mid-career scientist, 20 minutes, and uh, it's altogether one hour. 
uh, according to the time zones of the speakers, and it's, it's called the GON uh, webinar, Global Ocean Oxygen Network webinar, but you also find it via the, the good uh, web page. And if you want to speak, produce, uh, pr present your ideas there, please do so, contact us, and uh, otherwise you only can listen, of course. But uh, we are looking for uh, um, stimulating ideas and new ideas, new people that help us moving the field forward here. And maybe before closing, I will give you the word because when you give your talk, you apologize for not being a biologist. So I don't exactly remember what you say, but it's exactly the connection that we need. Yeah, it's your connection, so it's... Uh, very important. Yeah, I'm relieved. Uh, I, I was feeling like an outsider uh, no. all day, but uh, when I saw uh, the word economics, uh, <laughs> now I can sleep in peace tonight. Uh, no, seriously, um, I think uh, this is one of the most important parts that you should uh, focus on. Uh, everything else you're doing well, except how to go get the fundings, for example. So the people who's going to give you the money needs to know what is the impact on the population, right? So this population are voting, right? There's a lot of call on how to mitigate this uh, uh, impact on the uh, coastal communities. There's uh, women as well uh, involved in small-scale fisheries is also important. Uh, there is a lot of things done uh, on, on the side of economics. You can benefit from the uh, um, uh, benefit transfer method. So if something already exists, you can uh, use that. Um, there is uh, just an idea that springs to mind right now is that, uh, for example, we, uh, we are fighting out with the uh, harmful subsidies, right? So if you can show that you can have a good subsidies that goes into the oxygenation, mm -hmm. so that can increase the visibility of the idea, et cetera. I'm not going to take long, but uh, this is uh, something that uh, could be uh, discussed as well. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you very much. And so we will have to produce a kind of compte rendu. Yeah, I carry last. last. Okay, just really, really quick. Um, I was actually going to call you out because we need you. We do need you. And um, so to address three and <laughs> three and five and eight together, I think we could do it um, because that because you. I mean, there's a lot of ways we could do it. But to keep it short. I would like to say that we have a lot of brain power here, and we could take a beer break and write down a bunch of ideas, and I'll buy the first beer for anybody who wants to do it. Um, so think about that. Come talk to me about it. We can't do it tonight on the boat. Well, we could start on the boat, but, but anyway, so we, this is a good concentration of people, and we could start to think about some of those. Okay, and he's going to help me. Okay, so thank you. So we will have to produce a kind of summary of the discussion, and the organizer asks us that. Maybe it's Natalia, you can uh, explain exactly what we are expecting. We will produce something, and then we will circulate it to the community, is what we will do. Uh, yes. <laughs> no? Uh, I think that there are potentially two products. One is a more minor product that we provide at the end of the conference, and then one is a potential secondary kind of perspective piece from the community from the session about where are the research advances and the research needs that are really coming out around deoxygenation. And uh, yeah, there were a lot of really excellent talks today and we have uh, excellent talks tomorrow and excellent posters tomorrow. So there are, there's, as Karin said, there's a lot of great brain power in the session. Thank you. Yeah, yeah just quick comment on that. Tomorrow there will be also presented um, by our colleague from ISIS, I think I forgot his name, I'm sorry, um, uh, about the special issue for this conference. And so there's a potential for us as well to think of maybe having a, a tiny piece in there. So uh, I hope that the boat will help uh, and the drinks associated to that. So let's think and uh, looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Tomorrow, 8.30, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. <laughs> today.